Hey fam, welcome to Punks for Progress. I'm Reverend Aaron. This here is a fam chat. I've got a number of members of the P4P fam over here waiting patiently. Let's jump over here to where they are. Nope, they're over here actually. Sorry, I almost went to the wrong place. Here we are. Um, how about let's just everybody uh, introduce yourself and um, starting with Indiana. How's that? Okay, I, I'm Price Nash of Critical Thought Critique and Punks for Progress, Indiana. Hi. Word. Hi, I'm Kate with uh, CTC and Punks for Progress, as well as uh, various other organizations in Indianapolis. Fantastic. And hi, I'm. Th I didn't know you were going to give me an introduction. Sorry. Of course, I'm you're so here. I don't know what I'm from or I'm <laughs> So, Cal Shan, come on now. So, we're going to discuss a few things today. Um, we're going to um, discuss a lot about um, revolutionary leftist perspectives on the fucking Biden administration, right? We're going to discuss um, big tech. And sort of um, its its hold over our fucking um, communal spaces, right? Our community spaces. And oh, oh, no, oh, God. the Chauvin trial began. So we're going to discuss that some too. But um, I think what I'll do is I'm going to shoot it over to you, Price Nash. So um, and to get us kicked off on the Biden discussion. How's that sound? Well, I'll try. Uh, I so he's been in office what two months now, and uh, he has bomb illegally bombed Syria. He said he was going to pull it out of the Yemen conflict, uh, but which is a bunch of bullshit. Which you can actually decipher from the announcement itself much like uh, in the style of obama where uh he never actually said he was going to close guantanamo bay for example he just got us thinking that uh so what else i you i think one of you told me they uh just reopened uh a kitty jail or two uh, that was closed under Trump and closed he because it also, was on. Let me say real quick. It was closed because um, it was on toxic waste. It was built on a toxic waste dump. Oh, no shit. Yeah. Get the Go fuck ahead. out of here. So then yeah, he also. Of Indianapolis and only build jails on toxic waste to fit there for grownups. Uh, <laughs> ah, God. Yeah, which is uh, what the city of Indianapolis has recently done with their new jail. We, we only have the most humane and environmentally friendly death camps in Indiana. Uh, and he promised he will not go after the Saudis after for the Khashoggi murder where they chopped the guy and put him to pieces and all that. And, uh, yeah, I think there might be a few other things I'm forgetting, but uh, the list just goes on and on. And I feel vindicated at this point a little bit and uh, suggesting that the newer slicker Trump that everyone is so worried about could very well be Biden. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. That was, you were um, speculating that pretty early on, you know, cause all of us on P for P, I think we were all in agreement that like, what's really like from the beginning of Trump was what's really terrifying is if we get an intelligent focused, Okay. real deal fascist knowing you know a, a, like a person with a grasp on history and wow that would be terrifying now look biden kind of meets a lot of those um you know descriptors right his style is turning out very trump like in my opinion just the way he talks and presents himself yeah, the only difference is willing to, you know, 
read whatever fascist man's uh, speech writer is right out for him instead of like, uh, you know, babbling inanely for half an hour and repeating himself, you know. <laughs> True. Well, and, and, let's see, what was it I, uh, <clears throat> I don't tweet that often and that don't often. follow me. Um, <laughs> uh, but what did I tweet earlier? It, in re it was relevant to this discussion. Um, you got uh, blocked by Ben Horton. Uh, oh yeah, I got. <laughs> that's all that. Yeah, that's pretty cool, huh? Nice. Um, the far right media pretends that Biden has made quote sweeping and disastrous changes to U.S. border policy. The reality is he's fully perpetuating the Trump administration's child separation policies and violence against refugees. Hashtag kids in cages. Hashtag blue MAGA. Yeah. He literally said, don't come here. Stay there. We're not going to let you in. That's what he said. Blue, blue MAGA, I think, is also like really fitting. Uh, when you like even just think about like his old campaign slogan, right? Like his whole his whole slogan was build back better. And I was like, you know, is that materially or like semantically any different from make America great again, right? Like, you know, there was a time in which like America was was good. We gotta build back to that. Uh, to that pre lapse very <laughs> moment, right? Like And the people right? that embrace that notion are like we're talking shit on make America great again. You know, it's because they could what own the orange man or whatever, you know, like, and then they turn around and with Biden, it's like, Oh, yeah, yeah we're going to restore d democracy. Like what fucking democracy are you talking about? Um, I understand we have a form of representative. We have a Republic that like has a, component of it that one could describe as democratic i mean we get to pick the people who um <laughs> you know um administer our subjugation um right you get to pick your misrepresentatives every year <laughs> but democracy um nah I, I, that's what we're all striving here as anarchists and communists for that's what we're striving for is actual democracy because it doesn't exist and never has in this fucking disgusting America caca, man. Fuck, man. Yeah. And it's, I don't know, I guess I would say in a lot of ways, at first, um, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to what Biden was doing because well, I wasn't expecting anything other than, um, hey, I'm going to keep doing what Trump's going to do, but I'm going to like make it look like it's for like, um, you know, altruistic reasons somehow. <laughs> That's what liberals do, right? But we, we, in 2021, we are so fucking, I, I'm astounded. I, I, the, it's like we live in a goddamn Philip K. Dick novel, man. We're, we're, oh, yeah. we have this amazing technology. We're sitting here as anarchists and communists trying to build a revolution underground against the goddamn fucking fascist imperialist American state. Meanwhile, there is a deadly pandemic outside. If you go outside, you could catch a disease and die. So we're all wearing masks. And I'm not, that pandemic is real. And please wear a fucking mask when you go outside. In fact, the CDC recently, not so long ago, suggested two masks. I have been doing that when I go to the grocery store. Um, so don't misunderstand at all anyone who may be watching this. The pandemic is real. But again, it just, it's hard not to get depressed about how truly fucking dystopian it is. It's like everything that we were saying is going to happen if we don't right now, it's here. You know, and Biden is a full on. He's a fucking fascist, man. And I don't I don't buy into this. It's hyperbolic shit. He's a full on fascist, man. He's there defending. Dude, they're fucking. The cops have not stopped fucking attacking leftists. Fucking cop ran over a fucking um, protester in L.A. yesterday and shot protesters. And one of them, thankfully, um had some kind of thing in their head that made um, microwaves draw to them magnetically. And so a 
pig took a literal microwave oven to the face. Um, but because Kamala Harris is the vice president doesn't mean he's not fascist, man. Um, I don't know. You tell me, fam. Am I being hyperbolic to label him as such? Kamala is a cop, so what? I don't even... Like yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say Kamala Harris being vice president or, um, made some seems like kind of a... She made ahead. some horrible decisions, I'm sorry, not policy, but like with our, our prisons and shit. Like, she, she just loved to open shit up. So. Here's a question, fam. Here's a question that I think is on topic. Um... Let's be real and let's and maybe introspect a little. Um, can you come up with a, a, a specific example of something in your life that has changed because Trump's gone and Biden's in? Honest question. The, the, the left wing movement in Indiana is basically totally gone. Uh, that's changed. Uh, but that's basically it. Well, I mean, my daughter has rights. That that's kind of important. That's what I was gonna say. This is what the Democrats do. Biden reinstalls or extends, I'm not sure which DACA, and then opens up two more concentration camps. Right? It's like, yay! So you're not looking at over here. Right. It's it's that kind of a thing. That is the only difference, I think. I will say as much as I hate to admit it, that I'm not sure these vaccinations would be rolling out as quickly if uh, Trump got reelected. That, too. So, you know, maybe <coughs> maybe I'm going to be kicked out of anarchy. OK, but I voted for Biden okay. and fuck off if you got issue with it. But it was First time one reason only. I was convinced he would fucking do this with COVID. I was convinced he would address COVID. That's it. That's it, man. Like, I want to go outside again, man. I want to fucking hang with people. I want to march in the street and not worry that I'm going to fucking get sick or get some of my comrades sick. But... I think that would be handled more, but in California, I'm kind of safe to say that it, they were going to vote for Biden anyway. It happens every fucking time. It always goes Democrat. So that's why I didn't vote for president, because I, I had a real hard time. He's accused of sexual harassment, and I'm going to vote for him. I'm a fucking hypocrite calling Trump out, right? So it, it just didn't feel okay with me to vote at all. For president and i deeply respect that too shan and it's like i just had as a i just had my voting rights restored this year and um and i wasn't gonna do it i wasn't i wasn't gonna vote and um but we also had a um person run locally that had close associations with the proud boys and um oh, shit. I, I yeah um, Eddie Lorton was his name. He fucking lost. And if you, fuck you, Eddie Lorton, you fucking fascist piece of shit. Fuck you, homie. Fuck you. Hit me up. I'll debate you on anything. Anything, Eddie fucking Lorton. Fuck you. Anyway, trigger a little bit. <laughs> um, but yeah, literally, that was the thing. I was totally convinced. I was like, okay, great. You restored my voting rights. What the fuck do I care? I'm not into fucking picking somebody new to beg for scraps from, okay? Um, like, but Eddie Lorton running and his associations with the Proud Boys and, and COVID and COVID. Because if that, it's the one thing I can tangibly point to, I think, and say that it's different, is that, um, that we have the, um, the bully pulpit is telling you to wear a mask now. It means more people are wearing them. Um, that's true. Yeah. I just saw a thing today about someone did a study about the white. Um, I don't want to say it was white extremist. It was more like Karen violence, which that's extreme. Um, 
I'm not trying to belittle that. But it, it's not them just directing it at um, people they don't know, their neighbors and everything. But what the study was saying is that how many times these people have invoked Trump's name when they're doing their assaults or harassment. And I don't know the number because I didn't finish watching the clip, but I'd, ha I'd yeah, say you ha I there's no way to calculate like the number. I have stood on the street so many times and every time those fascists did anything, they either said USA or Trump. Like literally, like really, that's what they said every time they did that shit. USA, you Trump, Trump. USA means white privilege, white power. That's all it means to me because what you're yelling that at me and I was born here too. So what the fuck does that mean? It means nothing but White nationalism, white supremacy, right? I guess. Other than being at a sporting event with another fucking country, why the fuck would you chant that? It makes no sense to me. I also hope the other team win. <laughs> I don't even understand it in sports because sports is about camaraderie and having fun and stuff to me. So that's why I so hate they that say. Shit. So, they say. so they say. <laughs> so they tell us. <laughs> it's not. It's not. That's, why I don't like it. that's why I don't like it. So I have a question. Uh, <clears throat> forecast anyone for uh, next four to eight years, say? Hmm. Oh, my, my personal forecast is that, like, like one, the ice shit is here today, unless like a mass movement is built surrounding it. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, like inter-imperialist war, uh, it's looking very grim, uh, considering like the U.S.'s continued like aggression in Syria and Yemen, um, as well as like you know their uh leaving uh afghanistan right like doing the whole hard reset uh and essentially just like it, 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 you know uh it's it's looking bad uh i very much see like a inter-imperialist war coming fairly soon maybe not in four years there is almost an inevitability like within the next decade yeah, there's so much groundwork, I think, that's that's being laid for another one of those massive shifts in sort of like World War One, like the chaos of World War One in a way. Um, where I, you know, where World War Two starts with a very specific date and it's this thing and it was just to, to do this and this and whatever. Right. World War One is, re it's a lot hard. I mean, it's capitalist fucking trying to figure out how to divide up the world, right? But like, I, I think that um, the like anti-China rhetoric is alarming. It, and um, I don't think that um, it's just a sort of remnant of Trump's rhetoric. I think that the capitalist imperialist class are way pushing hard against China. It's not a defense against China or, or, or a critique of China, whatever. It's just... I see, I see you, Western imperialism. I see what you're doing. And I also think that like um, on the maybe a more, little more tinfoil hat tip, um, I think that Russia has much to gain. <clears throat> you know, the wealthier elements and influences in Russia have much to gain from a conflict between the U.S. and China. Um And it just, and and coupled with all the very much more specific stuff that Kate just outlined, um, what what are we gonna do to combat that, fam? <laughs> A few thousand of us march. Like I remember marching against the first Desert Storm when we brought out massive fucking numbers at that time, 
And that war um, ran its course exactly how the Western imperialists wanted it to the whole time. And we don't even have that. We don't have even a remnant of that foundation. I guess the one thing missing from this fucking Philip K. Dick novel is, is glo massive global fucking warfare, right? Yeah. And if we have another world war, it's not just gonna, China's the main, but Venezuela, Cuba, it's, and I don't even want to think about that. Uh, this country's My had a bummer for destroying Cuba forever. Uh, so, the U.S. military, you may not have heard, met with uh, the Taliban a few months ago and agreed to withdraw all troops by May 1st. And the Taliban is like already sort of supposedly mobilizing to keep us to that. And like, and there could be like a sort of a Ted offensive if we don't. And it'd be, it's really, I'm really interested to see what happens. I think it's very likely it could be a hard reset to the whole war and a bloodbath will happen. But if not, then, you know, my hopes and dreams have been for years now that the U.S. empire is going to draw to a close and maybe... That would be an indication of drawing down if we actually ever do get out of Afghanistan. It would be the first time in forever we have withdrawn from a country. Like, what, since Vietnam or Grenada or something like that? I, I'll believe it when I see it. Where, where are we going to get our heroin? Good point. I thought the same thing. Also, I just want to say that, like, it's either... U.S. Empire is weakening, or U.S. Empire seeks a different strategy altogether. Uh, one that's not so situated explicitly on like a definitive regime change and in installing puppet governments, but rather one of just like permanent destabilization of areas. Uh, I think we've preserve, already like, been on that. Influence. Uh, I think we've already shifted to that strategy. It seems Syria like starting that. with like Libya. Right, and in, in that case, like if anything, for Empire, like this is a massive success. You know, the aerospace industry and the military-industrial complex all gets paid, uh, and um, you know nothing about their sphere. The U.S. Empire's sphere of influence in the Middle East is actually changed uh, out of their favor, right? Mm. Industry will get a lot of money too. They already do. Through fucking war. And and the whole thing is is we have no business warring at all when the climate's saying, Fuck you humans, get the fuck off of me, and I'm not gonna work anymore for you. Like I know that's a big contributor. Yeah, I feel like the military industrial complex is probably destroying the planet more than anything else. And they create the pathway for the corporations, too. So it's a double whammy kind of a thing. Yeah, like the the oil connection from oil to military. Definitely there. <clears throat> And we go in and rebuild stuff, but it's not the people from that country. It's our, it's American corporation right. and company doing it. Yeah, Halliburton and, and the like, right? That comes in and gets paid 400 times the amount it would actually take to buy a fork, you know, or to and I, USB port. You know? I'm even... These 
big yeah, corporate which... companies hire private security firms to protect them and their assets, and in the meantime, they're abusing and murder. It's kind of like it, it's like the uh, the man camps here. Well, it's the same. It's the same all over the world with that. It doesn't just happen here, you know. Yeah, what was the name of that firm that Buttigieg worked for? I can't remember their name. They were they were a consulting McKinsey? firm that went in. Yeah, that's it. What was it again? But they're one of those. Say it again. It's called like the McKinsey Institute or something like that. Thank I know you. it's McKinsey something. It's just one of those like hire to fire type fucking firms that no, you know, nobody would hire outside of a war zone, really, you know. And uh, that's that's part of the whole capitalist circle jerk that goes on in destabilizing countries. I'm sorry, I thought a dog the bounty hunter. It's like they're getting, they are. Dog the bounty hunter. Remember when his big thing to go to Mexico? I don't know who the fuck it was. He was trying to bust, but that's what these security, private security firm things remind me of. These are the kind of people that they have. Well, and you know, oh, yeah. the fact that um, Mercs is a thing. Mercs is a thing, fam. There, there's real Mercs in the world. It's not just like watching a, you know, Riddick movie. Um, you know, I mean, and of course, I think no um, Philip K. Dick novel would be complete without mercs, right? There's got to be fucking mercenaries. I mean, I did, I did a video. This it just it, this is another thing that really does genuinely freak me out, man. It's it's not this is unprecedented, I think. Um, but I did that video of Newsmax that was running a fucking charity to fucking donate to mercenaries. <laughs> to, not to mercenary foundations, but like not and not to raise money for military, which fuck them too, but it's I don't know. I don't have words to describe it. It's just dystopia. Oh yeah, I just thought of this, but like uh like various different like uh, not only the government of Duterte in the, the Philippines, but also like America, which, which has a bunch of military bases there, as well as some other nations that have sold uh, the Philippines arms, are currently on a campaign of uh, massacring communists. Uh, the uh, Duterte regime declared, uh, kill them all, uh, just like... I think a week ago or something, uh, in response to the like the morning uh, of the bloody free, Sunday. like seizure of territory in their people's war. Um, so yeah, imperialism is not going fucking anywhere under uh, Biden uh, of all people. You know, I'm actually. 15 pages into a four page piece that I'm writing for one people's project. <laughs> like literally I pitched it to Daryl thinking it would probably be about four or five pages and it's at 15 right now. And I still have to write the conclusion, but it's called, um, cyclical, um, transitions in fascist focus. Um, no, I, I can't remember what the, subtitle of it is but it's basically i wanted to do an examination of the way the state focused <coughs> on street level fascists and uh, under the reagan administration and the way the street level fascists viewed um the state under the reagan administration and the transition in b those relationships to the clinton foundation or the clinton foundation the clinton administration Right, because um, under Reagan, I'm arguing that um, you know he was a demagoguing figure. Well, and then I should say, and then I want to compare and contrast that to the transition from Trump to Reagan, and try and see if I find similarities in there. And then there's a shit ton of them. Um, the fact that Reagan was a demagoguing um, 
figurehead, you know, a, a demagogue who began his campaign in, um, 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 I can't remember the name of the city in Mississippi, um, on doing a states' rights speech. But the city in, in Mississippi is where the three civil rights act, activists were murdered by the coalition of Klan and cops. Mississippi burning movie. So he kicks off his 1980 campaign there and gives a speech about states' rights. I mean, I, I know I don't have to remind you, fam, of the relevance of the notion of states' rights. That was the nonsense that the Confederacy used to, um, as a, like they were fighting for states' rights. And it's like, well, what states' right? The right to own other people and subjugate black people and, and do anything they want to them and violently. Anyway, um, so he facilitated. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I will say that's not actually explicitly Confederate. Like the the states' rights as rhetoric arises uh, in contemporary politics with the campaign of Barry Goldwater, uh, which Hillary Rodham Clinton uh, yep. was. Uh, I'm a proud Barry. I'm a proud Goldwater girl. She said. Right. Right. Uh, and like basically states rights was always used to just like be a dog whistle to mean like anti-civil rights right Right. like saying what the states decide doesn't mean anything like like what are you talking about like we we asked you if you believe that like black people should be able to eat in the same restaurant as a white person and you answered like let the states decide what do you so that doesn't answer anything like it it means no uh, yeah yeah uh, but but that's where states rights comes from as well as that post hoc bullshit justification of like uh, the civil war being on states rights like right. you know and, that, that was obviously and, never true and reagan and, and reagan understood all of that when he gave that speech in Mississippi, right? And, um, but then, but what you look at, so then what happens in the 80s and 90s? Uh, actually, I'm not quite sure, and you don't have to tell us, how, but um, if you were, I don't know if you're old enough to remember, Kate, what went down with Nazi boneheads in the eight, 80s and early 90s. Um, but I think that they were very much facilitated. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I said I was born a decade later. Okay. I definitely- Okay, so, but they were definitely, I think, that, you know, we remember, I know Shannon and Price remember, you know, Geraldo and, and the Jerry Springer and the Oprah episodes with um, the Boneheads and, um, and all the violence. And there was all kinds of drive-by shootings that they committed and all kinds of outright murders and just a lot of fucking, but, you know, and then what happens is the, and the state, the state under the Reagan and Bush years, they do nothing to um, stem any of that. But the second the Clinton, Clinton administration comes in is when Ruby Ridge kicks off and then the Waco thing. And then they actually really start targeting far right activists, which I argue in my piece was not to um, suppress them, but to further radicalize them and to sustain that anti-politics, anti-government sentiment, that far right, you know, um, paranoid fervor that they could call up with their stochastic, you know, with stochastic terrorist talking points and whenever they want, but they're playing with fire, right? Because so occasionally they got a night of the long knives, that shit. And I think that that's what the transition into the Clinton administration was, is like, you guys have been really useful to us maintaining the capitalist imperialist status quo for the last eight or 12 years. But, um, we're going to go with a different focus and we need to make sure, I mean, by that time, they're doing the sovereign citizen stuff. They're killing cops and shit. So they're like, yo, let's rein that in a little bit. <laughs> but we don't want to completely suppress it, right? And so I think we see hints of that with the transition from, especially with what happened in the Capitol on, the, on January 6th and the way the Biden administration seems like they're, we don't know fully yet what they're going to do about all that. But I think it's pretty, we have very good reason to suspect at this point that it's going to be similar to that sort of, um, uh, sort of rem- uh, uh, almost police state-esque, draconian, oppressive, you know, across the board measures, right? In response to 
the people that the Trump administration, the previous administration, the modern version of the Reagan administration, facilitated and stoked. I'll say this, and then, I, and then I'll, I'll kind of shut up, and I'd love to hear your, your guys' thoughts, but like, I think the one thing that the QAnons say that's accurate is that Q is a fucking um, state mechanism. I think it's a fully state-run fucking op to turn them into these fucking absolutely brainwashed stochastic terrorists. But they got to rein it in a little. <laughs> and so they're going to knight of the long knives them, I think. But in the process, they're going to use it as justification to target us. Because we're the real threat, right? The left. Anyway, so that's the kind of the gist of the piece that I'm writing. And I think it's kind of relevant to the topic. So I thought I would kind of describe it a little bit but i have heard uh people on the progressive left talk about that and how i think there's going to be this crackdown or that there's already a crackdown going on and rhetoric on uh counterinsurgence tactics and i can't say that i randomly put it on pbs news hour the other night and well it's actually like couple of weeks ago probably but they had this guy from the fbi on there the, the you know the 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 banner like under his name literally said uh former fbi counterintelligence um which so my which might have well have just said like former co intel pro right. <laughs> op operative and <laughs> he was literally saying we gotta have the we gotta break out the counterinsurgence tactics across the board all across the country to make sure another January 6th doesn't happen and all that. And, and, and PBS pushed oh, back yeah. hard on that, right? PBS being the bastion of, you know, <laughs> leftist socialism. I, I imagine, I didn't watch it, I'm asking, right? Like, they, they pushed back really hard on that and said how terrible that would be, right? Oh, yeah, of course. Of course not. Of course not. They, they, the Walter Cronkite factor of none. On that <laughs> one. I don't mean to laugh. So it is terrifying. And, and yeah, and I, I don't know if you have, but haven't you heard like some worse, like rumors on Facebook, Twitter, wherever about people being like visited by the feds and yes. shit, like leftists, you know? Yes. Yeah. And not rumors. Um, actually, legit comrades that I followed for some time going, I had a knock on my door and they wanted to ask me questions. And then watching fucking a bunch of like people who um, don't do shit but get on Twitter then start fucking bad jacketing the person who got visited. It's, it's no ugly, shit. man. It's ugly. And names don't matter, man. And you don't have to believe me, but I think like, these are comrades that I fucking trust, man, that I know have like put in some fucking like made sacrifices, yo, you know, and dude, there is so much going on. Um, a lot of people calling people cops and shit going on, dude. And I, I maintain, I've said this before and, um, and I, and I've, I, and I meant, and I wrote it in the last piece I wrote for CTC that these things um, do not manifest from any type of leftist form of organizing. We don't like. There's nothing built into socialism or anarchism or communism that um, makes you then bad jacket and and shit talk your comrades. I think that that's something that gets done to us from reactionaries and from the mechanisms of fucking imperialism. They stoke that in us. And then and they use our very justified fears of COINTELPRO. They use our knowledge of COINTELPRO to divide us. I can't prove any of that. I can't prove that any of that, I could be completely wrong. And maybe it's just something in leftism where we infight naturally regardless of the fact that I find nothing in any of our stated theories or histories that would draw me to conclude that we would do that to each other, I can point to a lot of things in history where, like we keep saying, COINTELPRO, that's exactly what they did to the Panthers and other leftist groups. It's like, you know, you know your homie's a cop, right? <laughs> like, and it's yeah. easier to just fucking do it on Twitter. 
It's so much easier for the fucking man to do that to us now. Because they don't have to physically infiltrate anything. Exactly. I was just about to say, that theory about the last couple of months is like, I don't actually think our like left-wing organized spaces are like as infiltrated as a lot of people would like lead you to believe. Like, no doubt if you like, have an organization that grows to like 300 members, one of them's a cop. Like, no. But like most of like our cadres, for example, have like seven people, uh, and many many of whom have known each other for years, right? Like these people aren't cops, like, right? Uh, and like you know, that's that's why I think like a lot of this like uh, bad jacketing stuff. Uh, makes it makes most sense to me that it's coming from like Twitter and exterior sources rather than like you know whispers within the the actual org itself. Um, uh, not to say that there aren't like active bad actors out there um, that are in organizations, but like yeah, like the I I think you're right. Uh, and 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 no and that is such an incredibly important clarification Kate thank you because um look it's conceivable that one of the dozen or so people in the P for P for fam could be a cop i guess but we just we just have gotten to know each other so much more there's bonds there and there's levels of trust that are built over time and we to to i guess i don't know but we have we're experienced leftists most of us here and we're a little more like can spot that shit. And, and I think that the same can be said for like you just said, the average group is what, seven to 12 people really. And they're interacting with each other regularly and so much harder to infiltrate that as a cop. But, um, and I, I, and I, I guess I would say to back that a little bit, like, and what you were saying, like when I see that on Twitter, Basically, if I see you on Twitter calling somebody a cop, I just kind of go, you don't know what the fuck you're doing. I, you know, first of all, don't do that. Don't do that. Even if they are. Like, you better come with a shit ton of receipts if you're going to publicly fucking call somebody a cop. Fuck you. Fuck you for that. Fuck you. Don't do that, man. Like, I'm uh, another organization that I work on. I've been, like, designing uh, policy surrounding... Uh, uh, collective harm and accountability and abuse and conflict. Um, and one of the notes in it, like about like snitching and bad jacketing, which is like, if you're going to call somebody a snitch, you have to have like evidence. Like if you make an accusation without evidence, you're, you're done. Like, no, you can't fucking do that. Like that's, you're putting people's life in danger when you call the, when you snitch jacket or bat or cop jacket them. It's, it's exactly. that's a legit thing. And because every bit of that history, I mean, it was invented by COINTELPRO that we know of, or at least that I know of, but, um, but it was so they would kill each other, not just to affect their ability to organize, but that they would kill each other so that they don't have to go in and murder them all like they did Fred Hampton. Right? That gets messy for them. So... Right. They don't want to create martyrs. They want to create like infighting and division in, in its own right. Like, it's, you, you know, that, like that's something that I thought was actually great about that movie, uh, Judas and the Black Messiah. Uh, they like kind of bring up uh, and like, I think Martin Sheen plays uh, uh, Herbert, Herbert yeah. Hoover. No, that's right. Uh, <laughs> Jay Edgar. And I'll say he, he plays him not I, that well. It's, I think it's the worst performance in the movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's just like Martin Sheen's worst role. Uh, but he, he does say something correct in it, which is like, you know, uh, sending Huey Newton to prison made him a celebrity, you know. Uh, yep. And it, he did. Yeah, it, it totally did. Uh, not with As well as... Go ahead, Chan. I'm sorry, I cut Kate off. Did you want to finish? Notwithstanding. 
Oh, I was just saying, notwithstanding any of, like, more nefarious behavior of, like, uh, Huey Newton toward the end, tail end of the 70s. Uh, that, that is it. I, I just was going to say that it also makes the FBI look bad. And they don't want to look bad in the vast public, right? They want to be the good guy because it's a good cop, right? Right. They want to go on PBS and and be celebrated for the tyranny that they're going to fucking inflict on us. (laughs) Totally. It's like when cops rescue someone or they're doing their fucking job. Why are they a hero? I'm, I'm sorry. They literally are paid to do that, not the other shit, but whatever. And, you know, Kay, you know, um, that's what it said. <laughs> Jay Edgar recognizing that um, their demonization of Huey um, further, uh, you know, emboldened his celebrity or whatever. They have to understand that, that like, look, I mean, everybody, a lot of people in this country know the name Q Shaman. You know, and they can keep us up to date on his trials. And I I, I just oh, yeah. think that it's going to further, you know, I, I said from the start, you know, that that just gave Hitler his opportunity to fucking write Mein Kampf. <laughs> you know, some of these people, when they're going to do time and they're going to write their Mein Kampfs and they're going to become that hero on the right to the right. And I just think that the imperialist powers know that. Right. Like, they're not fucking <laughs> up. It's not a mistake. It's not an accident, yeah. right? Absolutely not. Because, like, for new African political prisoners, for example, like, they're put in prison to, like, try and annihilate them and, like, separate them from their, like, uh, loved ones and their ability to, like, coordinate and organize on the outside. Whereas, like, these people likely won't even be treated as political prisoners. Because, as it turns out, like, being white and Republican is apolitical. Uh, <laughs> and it's all the, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, so they're going to have a lot more, like, freedom of movement than ability to produce something like that rather than, like, you know, uh, on, like, uh, it's George Jackson, where, like, right. you know, and they're going to have, a, and they're gonna have a, a, I don't think a single one of them has been in solitary. I haven't heard any reports of any of That's those folks being in solitary. solitary. Oh, no, they won't go to solitary. White people aren't. Right. Uh. Yeah, they're going to have a much bigger megaphone. Yep. I mean, they'll have somebody pay for their phone card. Pay for their phone card. You know? And there won't have to be a grassroots GoFundMe to pay for it. And it'll be unlimited minutes Silver on that phone card. And well, for people who don't know, phone cards Silver in prison, in um, it's it's a fortune. You could you could lose your house in a year paying for phone calls if your family's locked up. I mean, I'm not exaggerating, man. It's one of the most disgusting extortion rackets in the prison system is those fucking phones, man. But if you're poor, you, it, you can't talk to your family, man. <laughs> and... And if you do, like, a, the average phone call can be 30, 40, 50 bucks, man, for 10 minutes. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, we're aware. Indiana is one of the most expensive states uh, for phone calls, as well as emails. Uh, I think it costs, like, $20 to get, like, 10 email credits. And email is limited to, like, I think, like, 10,000, no, not 10,000 characters, like 2,000 characters. It's quite short. And I wonder if they charge more for a stamp, you know? Because I know commissary, everything is like, all the prices are jacked up, but I wonder if they jack up the prices for postal stamps. Are stamps money in Indiana? Okay. Are stamps money in the in the um, DOC, in the Indiana? In Nevada, stamps are your money. It's not like, you know, you see in the old movies, it's cigarettes, you know, but you know, how, oh. many, how many smoke you got for, you know, whatever. It's stamps. Like, that's the currency for exchange. You can fucking, um, they can um, violate an inmate in Nevada for having too many stamps. Oh, wow. 
because that wow. implies selling drugs or whatever, right? And they'll only sell you so much, yeah. so it's really easy to monitor if they, you know, if they tear up somebody's house and find that, you know, their stamp collection is larger than their commissary numbers, you can be violated. Right. Uh, I, I don't know about the practice, um, uh, but it could very well. But also in terms of like, drugs, selling and distributing drugs, that's all done by the fucking guards. Like the prisoners. Of course. Are. Like it's all done by the fucking guards. Like, no fucking. Yeah. I mean, I, come on, people out there watching. <laughs> You really think inmates can get it in without help from the guards? It's just, especially in our modern prisons. They're high tech. They're searched from fucking five times before you get anywhere. And, um, and how much can you really cram up your ass? Just give me a break, man. It's just not, there's only one way all that shit can get in there. Right. And it's not and a departure from what the government does, man. The CIA are drug dealers. Our government are drug dealers. I mean, what, we were talking about Afghanistan earlier, and it's like, like I said, and I didn't get much pushback from y'all. My first thought was, yeah, but where are we going to get our heroin from? I, I, I'm not seeing much uh, reason to think they're going to leave Afghanistan, right? We're drug, it's drug dealers. Right. Where'd we get the cocaine for crack? Oh, yeah, from, from a dude Place. that lives in Compton. A dude in Compton was able, you know... <laughs> was able to get fucking, you know, 500 kilos of fucking cocaine brought in. Sure. Yeah, it was all yeah, the CIA wasn't involved at all. Nah, nah, nah. That's I not what the Contras was, was about at all. No, 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 no. Give me a fucking break. You know. There literally were hearings about it that people like to forget. My dad, I'm sorry, dad. But he goes, well, I don't know about that. And I'm like, Oliver North, like, but you don't remember all those hearings? Because I do. I, I was a kid and I didn't even want to fucking care about it. You know? <laughs> anyway. But yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting to see. Problem. Like, I think there's a lot of reason to, like, we're basically doing a lot of speculating on what to expect from Biden right now. It's 50 days. 51 days, 50 days. Um, but I am interested. It's off to such a great start, interested. though. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. Um, um, but I'm, I'm I, interested to see what happens to see what in the futures of these people that are gonna uh, that have been charged. Um, these absolute pieces of shit that have been charged by this imperialist piece of shit state for what they did on the sixth. Um, I'm really curious to see what becomes of them in the, in the next year or two. And then in terms of, you had asked a lot, way earlier, Price, um, what I thought would happen in the next four to eight years is, um, I think in 2024, uh, is that the next one? That's the next, that's the midterm, right? 2024? 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Oh, <laughs> uh, 2022 is the midterm. Um, like, it's going to go it's going to shift all the way to the right. That's, that's my thinking. Um, because the, that's usually what are the uh, Democrats doing? The Democrats are out here going, we're really, really right wing, except we, we, um, we hashtag stuff that right wingers hate sometimes. You know, like, and we talk, we still talk shit about Trump. Yeah. Right. 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 <laughs> right. The, the democratic platform is still essentially like just orange man, bad. Whereas like, the Republican platform is going to be the Democrats promised you $2,000 and didn't give it. Uh, they promised you minimum yeah. wage and you didn't get it. Right. I, I know what's going to be more compelling to you know, the undecided voter. Uh, it's still going to kind of be fuck Trump, fuck Hillary. It's going to be the same thing. Right. As the last eight years. Well, and, and I'll tell you, like, all the headlines I'm seeing, like, from Newsmax and, and, and stuff, um, it's the massive um, out-of-control death and chaos at the border, okay, because his radical, radical agenda and changes from, and, and his abandonment of the Trump fucking uh, 
I, he's not. I mean, there's no change. I, Trump made or Biden made one speech where he said something about something changing border policy. All I've seen is a complete perpetuation. And like we said earlier, a reopening of camps that were closed um, on a toxic fucking wayside. And so uh, but what that's going to effectively do is further radicalize these already full on radicalized right wing terrorists like and I think they're going to rally behind these pieces of shit that are going to do time for what happened on the 6th I don't think Q ain't going nowhere um yep did you get a chance to watch that there, 60 minutes Australia just did like a 25 minute piece on its influence in Australia I haven't watched it yet but it, it's in Britain too it's this is a global fucking model type thing for the right wing to mobilize people Right. I think the next four years are going to be the mass base building of the the right wing. Uh, and then like 2022 or are going to be their like just thorough stomp victory lap. Because um, like, you know, the, the Democrats are controlled opposition that won't do anything. Right. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, it's. Yeah, they're waiting. They're doing the re reuniting families, but they they can't find the families. Thousands right? of them because thousands they waited of families that they have long. no I'm idea. Not talking fifty days. I'm saying why asshole was they could have fucking done something about that. They didn't. It's gross. So we spent I mean, an hour on that topic, fam. And I think unless any of you guys want to have more further thoughts on the transition to Biden, we had a couple other topics we were going to discuss, right? Um, Price? Is the left going to sleep? Is the left going to sleep now because Biden's in office? So I think I the think short I'm answer old. is no. I think the short answer is no. And here's why I say this. Because... Um, People that were really, 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 really um, freaked out because of Trump, um, that doesn't necessarily mean they were the left. I think we know that. We've seen that a lot, like the way liberals freak out on us a lot. They really, really hate Trump, but we, they would say like, so a lot of those people that were not our comrades or allies. And yes, I think we all knew that a lot of the fucking hashtag resistance was going to hang up and go home and... And I think there was a lot of talk on the left about, well, what do we do when that happens? And I always kind of went, good, like go, because you people were really no use to us all along. Just hating Trump and, and sharing things all the time. It's, we needed more than that. And maybe I'm being overly dismissive of them and, and, and the role of clicktivism and stuff, but like, I think I don't think any uh, um, solid committed revolutionary leftists are any less committed to revolutionary leftism today as they were 52 days ago. I think a lot of liberals are going home, though. I do agree with you. Uh, the, the point in which I would diverge is that, like, you know, the, the actual left is not going to go anywhere. Uh, and I think we knew that before. But, like, in terms of, like, mobilization, uh, getting people out uh, into the streets to support anything is going to be a nightmare. That's a good point. Uh, over Absolutely. The next couple of, because all of the liberals and, like, those types of contacts that we've, like, developed over the last couple of years will never come back out. Uh, not not until another Republicans in office that they're going to be like, oh, this war makes me mad. Uh, not not the four other wars that were going on when when my guy was in office. Uh, you know, uh, so while the left isn't going to sleep, uh, the, the counterinsurgency and the like um, like uh, graveyard of uh, social movement 
uh, still ring very true in terms of like the Democratic Party seizing power. Oh, and then now we got the movement for a People's Party playing assist. <sighs> Please don't do me any favors. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the dro subject dropped. I'm dropping the subject. Oh, you don't have to drop the subject. I just, um, you said, you know, People's Party for the yep. assist. I'm saying to them, please don't do me any assist. I don't need, I don't um, need their yeah. version of favors. <laughs> um, right. And I'm not. That's not to say that everybody that's like embraced that this People's Party thing is some fucking worthy of being shit on or whatever. A lot of them are. A lot of them are some full of shit, motherfuckers. Um, I will say one thing. I do think the younger generation of who would call themselves progressives or even liberals, they'll be in the street. That that's where that's who you'll find in the streets for um, police brutality, for hate crimes against Asians, for you know. That's when you're going to find it. So I think that that's a good thing that came out of Trump is that we did build some networking <coughs> with certain groups that are coming more radicalized as they organize. So that, and that's what we want. And, and I would also say, Shan, that like, I think we've um, observed that um, millennials and Gen Zers there's like per capita are, are further to the far further to the left than Gen X. And of course, far further than the boomers. There's way more millennials that are like, there's a big difference and have embraced real leftism, not some progressive. I went to Lollapooza twice and, and, um, you know, that's why I'm a leftist. Cause it's they've, they've read the Marx. Boomer, they've read Kropotkin the and shit, <laughs> you know, like, of the boomer and Gen X generation, though, I hate to admit it's partly my generation, but it fucking is. And some millennials, because they blame Gen Z, right? And that's both liberals and right-wingers that, that are doing that shit for cancel culture shit. And, and that's, how that sh that's how this stuff gets so fucking messy. And why we get tired of saying... No, no, look further, think more critical, you know, and we get the frustration from the progressives and li liberals for having to dream the same shit at them every few months about the exact same fucking thing, right? So do you think and that there'll be a lot more street action once we get over the main hump of COVID? Like, I'm I think there might be, a, I think there might it. be, like, we might feel like the left is sort of asleep because I think that we're actually, like, decent people who don't want to risk people's health. So we're a little less inclined to get out in the streets and stuff. Um, I don't know. That's uh, that's a genuine question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Do you... That totally, I mean, plays a part. But, I mean, if you look at just last weekend... And the week prior, with the case opening up and the unfortunate anniversary for Breonna Taylor and the attacks against Asian communities here in New York, I mean, all over, and it's risen astronomically. So, I mean, the, people are still going in the streets it's of course not like it was in the summer that i don't even know that the civil rights movement was like that ever i i don't know because i was not born in an infant so no it, but, it was a lot of the people that re, like have uh, first-hand accounts of the civil rights era were, no this is historic these are these are historic numbers um i remember texting my mom have you ever seen anything like this was this what it was like and she's like no, it wasn't like this. Oh, so yeah. that's hope. But we've definitely seen a lull, like in Indiana, 
extreme law and activity. And, uh, Here too. But don't you think that has a lot to but do with COVID? Course. Right? Like COVID, yeah. But now, let's not forget that uh, we've seen a uh, couple major organizations break up this past year. And I know uh, at least three of us here were speculating that that was some kind of co pro behind that. If not, so there, if not totally behind it, poking it. <laughs> you know, like ooh, yeah. ooh, look, there's some issues. Let's we can st stoke it here and stoke it there a little bit. Like, I, I will say I've learned more about the split in one of those like groups, and I don't think Coinsell Pro was really involved in that one at all. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think MCPOC is like just kind of coincidental that it like broke around this time as some of these other uh, organizations. But uh, from what I've gathered, like uh, their reasoning, like uh, for dissolving, uh, like makes sense. Like it wasn't just like everyone's, a, everyone in here is a revisionist cop except me. Right. Like that, that's not right. what happened. Uh, it, it was more focused on like, what should our goals be uh, going through where it is like having this particular uh, organization to, having to get that this together right now important or even like conducive to moving forward, you know. Uh, whereas like other organizations, I think like were definitely like suspicious in terms of not. I shouldn't say suspicious in that like their membership suspicious but in terms of the circumstances surrounding their uh, uh dissolution you know and this is a, yet another example of just how intensely toxic the whole cointel pro thing is and thank you so much kate for making that distinction and, and differentiating that because well, first of all, if we start even invoking, hey, was COINTELPRO involved? That's almost like pointing to some of our comrades and going, are you COINTELPRO? And maybe I, we shouldn't be doing that, man. This, especially that's like what we're saying with cop jacketing. And here it's so hard to find the language that's precise because, look, we have to be able to make the analysis and determine if the state is fucking trying to pit us against each other because we know for a fact that they that that is a thing it does but every time we we indulge that it's almost like just one degree of separation of pointing a finger at, at what may very well be a very very solid comrade you know and so again I, god it's just so well, fucking i always think i always think poison pen when i say go into pros so I don't, I don't know for myself. I don't understand the don't reference understand poison the pen. Reference poison pen. Yeah, like you don't have to be a, a cop to be convinced your comrades are cops. You know, like it, it's it's the rumor. Rumors can come from the outside or, or uh, mm -hmm. po poison pen was when they would write letters pretending to be oh. Panthers to gotcha, Panthers. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Which they did a lot of that. Yeah, I mean, the gang yeah. units do this tactic. The oh, gang yeah. Units do, they're former. Every law agency uses this tactic in their daily practices. So to think that the feds aren't doing it when we're having mass mobilization is would be short-sighted. Of course they're doing it. How they're fucking doing it this time maybe is more the question right you Not are if they are that's great you brought that up because it's not just the feds that are doing it these days it's local law enforcement agencies and their gang task force it's fucking dhs and the fusion centers and all that crap they turn neighbors against it's just the like neighbors. normal like out in the open in some cases well did our, did this state ever come out and go oh shit sorry for cointel pro 
<laughs> no. No. Um, and you think that every uh, single fucking every look fucking Department of Homeland Security, Department of Homeland Security has jurisdiction over every facet of human life in America, our ports, our water systems. Um, I mean, it's just. It, it's staggering the jurisdiction it has. And you think that they aren't taking notes from COINTELPRO? Yeah. And why don't they release the prisoners? Why is Peltier still in fucking prison? We know what happened there, mm -hmm. too. I don't think they've ever admitted it, though, have they? Just with the Panthers. I don't think they admitted it with AIM. And they didn't admit it about the Panthers. No, no. It, came it, it came out. <laughs> well, yeah, they couldn't deny yeah, I was gonna it say. <laughs> what it was. Yeah. And, and let's be clear. I, um, it's the, also the 50-year anniversary of um, the break-in by the Righteous Comrades that exposed Cointel to Pro to, to begin with. What was that, like last week? That, that was the anniversary of that. Uh, that's cool. I forgot about 50 that. 50 years? Yeah. I was two, almost three years old. Getting old. So, you know, if if there had been the public statement or speech of, yeah, we did that and it was awful, maybe, maybe we could start to think that every single law enforcement agency in the United States isn't and totally embraced COINTELPRO tactics. Um, but they didn't. Only righteous people that sacrificed much um, brought us that information. They infiltrated the fucking mafia, right? <laughs> I mean, that's hard to do. And they did it. I would say... Infiltrated and, like, utilized the mafia, like, uh, on an international scale, right? Like, like, yeah, like... I'm sure I don't actually have to tell you all the uh, what, like, how the United States government involved, like, Lucky Luciano and shit. Right. Uh, with all that stuff, with all the fucking, it's same thing with the Nazis, same thing with the alt right and the militias. It's this: we arrest half of you and then fund the other half. You know, I mean, it's not that 50-50, but, like, they're funding some while at the same time arresting their others. You know? Mm -hmm. it... Yeah. But they arrest the biggest threats. They don't arrest the biggest threats to them. Not the biggest threats to society. I guess that's how or, I Or it. are they a th the actual threat or are they able to um, market them as the biggest threat? The biggest threat. Right, like the Black Panthers. Like, let's get a bunch of people. Threat. Like, it would be really brilliant plan. And they just get a bunch of people to, like, pull the most ridiculous, actually non, truly non-threatening to state mechanisms, like, attack on our capital. So then we can then go, look, look, these are the worst. So now we got to go do all this stuff to you, to you. We got to do it. I know it sucks, doesn't it? That we got to exchange some of our liberties for freedoms. <laughs> Remember that? Remember that? During fucking mm -hmm. Bush Jr. and all the Patriot Act shit? Yep. And yeah. Tea Party is is. Q is the extension of the fucking Tea Party. Like, it's Tea Party is how these fuckers started infiltrating. Um, I'm sorry, the um, the Congress and the Senate. You All know right. what I'm saying? It's they've been working it for a long time. People want to act like right wingers are all stupid and they don't know how to organize, but they know how to fucking organize. They got money. Yep. So, is the left going to sleep, fam? Have we reached a consensus? Part of the left. Yeah. <laughs> Did we answer that for everybody and figure that whole thing out? But for... none of the far left is. <laughs> I, I think we put a nail in the coffin there. Yeah. Yeah. 
guess the conclusion is the capital L left? No. Uh, the yeah. lowercase left? Absolutely. But I think you were also, again, astute yeah. to point out that, um, look, we can kind of look down our nose at hashtag resistance, but having a shit ton more people at our actions makes a difference. It really does. Like, I, I don't want to, um, I don't know, show a lack of appreciation for that real fact. Like, having thousands of people out, even if they may never come to another march again, is a lot better than 12. A lot better than 12 people. And the news and, and media yeah. comes and asks us questions line. more when we have thousands of people at our march. You know? You know, the FASH can go out with three people on the street and be featured on primetime across the fucking board by every network. <laughs> but we got to bring out a few thousand be to get a blurb. And it'll probably be called a riot or something, though. <laughs> you know? Vandalism. Right. And, and wait, what else do they say? Like, when Violence. we hurt a building. Violence, yeah. Yeah. No. We yeah. hurt a building. Violence against private property. <laughs> so the last Get off my lawn. the last topic, I guess, was um, the role of big tech, as it were, Price. <clears throat> yeah, I was curious if uh, y'all seen uh, the same wave of like people crying about their. YouTube videos being demonetized or being put in YouTube jail and Facebook and Twitter jail and all the uh, big tech censorship going on of the left. Um, welcome to the last four years of Punks for Progress. Like we don't, I don't make the videos though. I don't, I don't go on Twitter and Facebook and make videos about when we get our shit censored. Okay. Right. I don't I, like. I'm just not about telling um, far right wing fucking assholes what they can do to hurt us. And I feel like every time someone comes out with this shit, they're fucking telling people, hey, man, I was mass fucking reported by a bunch of fash and it worked. Oh, woe is me. Well, thanks for the fucking thanks for giving our enemies fucking fuel and, and information that they can use against us. Okay, that's where I, I have a problem with that. And again, this is that thing of like, I'm not trying to um, like necessarily take away from people who are being censored and stuff because it sucks. But it's yet another example of the what we need, like of how we have to be so careful in the way we talk about shit. We have to be careful in the way we talk about who we call cops. We have to be careful about the way we talk about whether it's COINTELPRO or not. And we need to be care very, very careful about the way we tell people publicly the things that are happening to us by these social media platforms. And it's, it's a tough one, fam, because we also need people to know. Look, I am convinced, man, especially Zuck. That dude's a full-on fascist prick, man. He's all in. He's all in. I'm not as confident with YouTube in saying that, but I'm probably about 65 70% there. Um... These people are our fucking enemies, man. And oh yeah. And especially if you're going to be and making a lot of content that directly content targets, that the fash, targets the fash, this platform is going to fuck with you. I'll say this right now, man. We we have a fucking copyright strike against our channel because of I uploaded a guillotine truck video that shows right wingers beating the shit out of black people. And then it has context from right wingers in the 60s beating the shit out of black people. And and it shows how disgusting it is. There's there's text in the video that's that shows that we're not glorifying this, that we're adamantly against it. And we got a fucking hate speech block against us on that video. Yeah. I got hate speech for posting a flyer. Who's always in your neighborhood, Aaron? I Patriot Front. I can't remember. Patriot Front. And which they, was American what, Guard, which were, was originally a Klan Clavin. They they were passing out flyers at um, universities all throughout California, Southern, mostly Southern and Central, you know, Bay Area. 
and I had a heading on it, like heads up and, and what university, or it may be, it wasn't just universities, but colleges, it was found at. And someone reported it, obviously, and Facebook said that it was hate speech. And I still have a thing against me, like, that won't go away, that, like, if I get one more, like, hate speech thing, I'm done. I'm out of there. I'm out of Facebook. So it's always been happening when people come up with this, oh, it's not good for the left. It's like... You know, when they're deplatforming the right, what are you t- They've always been doing this to us. They never have stopped. It's not, I don't notice that it's gotten any worse other than like Rose City Antifa, like big I- players. That's who got deplatformed on Facebook when they made whatever fucking changes they made that we're unaware of. Can I just jump in on that? Please. Because what really drives me nuts about all that <clears throat> is that um, people, it just seems like people, so many people will jump on that bandwagon. Like that's this big important debate about whether we should deplatform people or not. And then these fucking progressives will say, oh, look, it's already happening now. We're getting deplatformed, like, as if freaking, you know, ultra-leftists unlock this Pandora's box, and it's fucking big tech that uh, controls the box, you know? Like, what the fuck? And I just want to state that a lot of these fucking ultra-leftists are as just as quick with the block button. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) Just saying, yeah. cancel culture, but I'm going to block you if you fucking, like, um, cr- <coughs> criticize my cancel culture narrative. <coughs> not saying yeah, Ben Burgess, hilarious. just saying Ben Burgess, not saying Aaron Matte or Ben Norton, not saying, just saying, you know, <laughs> uh, whatever. Yeah, and then people, like, cry about the cancel culture the call out culture because their uh, video got demonetized and i'm just like your video should have never been fucking demonetized in the first place it's corrupting your brain as we speak <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, so the platforms themselves are a huge fucking problem and i've seen people say <clears throat> it should be ch- turned into all of these should be turned into public utilities, the internet itself, and Facebook and YouTube. And I totally agree with that. But uh, a huge question that I don't have the answer for, but needs to be asked, is how do we do that? How do we get there? How do we how do we just seize fucking Twitter and shit like that? You know, well, I mean, that's been it's happened in I mean, our lifetime. They broke up, lifetime. Um, they broke up Bell Telephone. Um, Bell Telephone. Um, it's possible, but I, I'm like, t- I have a uh, my my first word was okay. Yeah, totally post capitalism though. <laughs> um, I don't think social media should be viewed like our water because it it involves uh, the. Uh, the expression of our ideas. Um, so it makes me really nervous. The idea of this imperialist state turning social media into utilities. I think it's probably arguably, arguably better than where we're at right now, but we should do it very cautiously. But I also have um, elaborated a little bit on what Sasha Baron Cohen suggested in terms of how to properly regulate these social media platforms. He deep throated said the ADL should be in charge of it. I I think that they should be involved. Like, I feel like maybe people from ADL, people from Southern Poverty Law Center, and maybe a a handful of other groups should build within their mechanisms a separate thing that can create a panel of people that are accountable to the community that are experts. Like I think punks for progress could probably put up a person that could contribute to this. And, and again, this is just in its Genesis, but like, 
I just think people that are generally that spend their lives committed to recognizing um, hate speech and bigotry should have a much stronger say in how we regulate these platforms. Um, that's not a deep throated advocation for any of those groups I just listed. Please understand that. Um, I definitely would never want the ADL to have full control over that, nor would I want the ASPLC to have full control over that. These, but it would have to be a diverse group of voices, but people who are experts on hate speech and, and, and bigotry and shit, right? Ex experts because they are discriminated against. So they can spot the narrative of that post. Because I post, I mean, I report um, transphobic and homophobic posts all the fucking time. And they say, I got it wrong. And they got it right. Well, who the fuck is reviewing this? This right. is totally fucking offensive. I know it's offensive, right? <laughs> right. And and I would also say that, um, again, that's it's a sort of citizen's review. They're not working for Facebook or working for TikTok or whatever it is, right? It, it's they're working to better society, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll say that I'm in favor of having this like uh, civilian review kind of thing. If if I'm on it, I'm allowed to bully the person that's from the ADL on it. <laughs> <laughs> That was Milo's two cents. I don't understand what he said, but it, it was something. Maybe he I... wants to be on the board, too. I think there should be public ownership and control of it. And I don't I honestly don't see how to get there without revolution. But the problem is that we need mass communication for the revolution you can't have community standards without the whole community at the table, right? Totally. So that's what every fucking social media platform needs that input, in my opinion. Yeah, and even, how to get there, that's where I'm confused. And even what I described is deeply flawed. <laughs> I, I, I stand by it's better than what we're doing right now, this Citizens Review Board or whatever, but like, I, that makes better me wary. That's, that makes me wary. I don't want a group to, it, mm, I'm so nervous about handing anyone the power to determine what like, what I'm saying is um, acceptable or not. But well, right now it's, it's Zuckerberg and his friends right. and Google and the Atlantic Council that gets to decide all that. And whoever gives them the most money. Yeah. Meanwhile, it is what it is. People get you know, and like and all sorts of stuff. Yeah, leftists should probably all just go to Discord for now, I guess. <laughs> uh, I'm on Collectiva. Oh, you should share that with us. Share I will. Share it in the Slack. Or I will. Remind cool. me, and I will. Um, Father Fury's over there. And, um, you know, as soon as you um, sign up, who is it? You get your instantly one of your friends is um, Stam. And uh, like automatically and, and gosh, what was the other one? I think it's going down becomes one of your first friends, you know, um, just automatically. Um, but I have what a, platform I, is that it's called with a K Collectiva. Oh, oh, it's theirs. Yeah, I'm pretty like sure it. that. Um, Stimulator, St Franklin Lopez from um, Submedia and, and others had a hand in generating and creating it. Pretty sure. I, I recall, I think Drew and I both shared information about it and I tried to, I think I had to get a new email and I wasn't able to do that. It was Proton or whatever. Yeah. 
it, it's, I think it's mainly where I'm at, even though I'm using data. It's not so much not being able to use Wi-Fi. It's, I don't have strong enough signal here to do upload <coughs> a lot of the time. I, you know, I, what just popped in my head, fam, is that like, it's called struggle for a reason. And I think one of the reasons it's good for us to talk about this, even though I don't like, like sharing tools that can be used to censor us by our enemies. Um, other people are experiencing this and you can really, really feel gaslit especially if you're listening to the right, because the right's going to tell you that they're the ones that are under attack and being fucking censored and shit while they're sending us death threats, literal death threats. If you, I will kill you, you F word, but you know, like, and then we report it and they're like, yeah, we don't see how that's harassment. You know, like, right. so you can really feel gaslit. Like, am I really experiencing this? And you can question your own, like, is this real? It is, fam. If you're out there and you're creating leftist content, and especially if you're going out the, at the right, you're being targeted, probably. And you probably are being censored. And it's just like, we have to accept at the base level that that is the reality and expect it. And, and, and it should motivate us to organize more to end capitalism, right? Word. I hope. <laughs> I hope too. Right. And that's if everything is fine, probably uh, uh, to fight against. Uh, you know, their, their continued repression, you know, yet another, yet another recruit. You know, just, just how, like, the, the pigs and the military are the world's greatest recruiters for the left wing. Uh, the blatant leadership and uh, attempted burying it like just another thing that like you know anybody that like is it is like oh I can like make in my head I can start connecting some dots um, so you know there's you know the very strong negative but as with all things uh, there's also another current So I just want to say, we didn't say that we were going to talk about this, but I wanted to mention that I'm really, really enjoying this new weekly show I'm doing with my cousin, The Foff, called New Leftist Questions with The Foff. Um, has any of you really had a chance or an opportunity to watch any of those yet? Um, I watched the first one. I caught a little of it. It's just he's new and he's in earnest reading sort of the 101 revolutionary anarchist reading list, right? And sharing his thoughts on it openly and asking questions and stuff. And it's um, he's been my family our whole lives. <laughs> uh, and uh, and he's a cool dude. And it's um, it's one of those things where it's like. I don't want to sit around and try and anticipate what some what a brand new leftist might be preoccupied or, or you know might be asking or curious about, right? Like, because um, I'd probably get it wrong if I tried to guess, you know. And so I'm not putting any effort into thinking about what how to target brand new leftists with our content. Like most of our stuff, really, I kind of take for granted they're already all in when they're watching our stuff, you know. But, so I just think it's fun. I, I really enjoyed it. Tackling some of these really beginning questions, right? Does it, it sounds kind of condescending are to call it beginning. No, I think there, it's a, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I just, it's just, I just had a brain fade. <laughs> You'll catch it. What were you going to say, Bryce? Well, are there any uh, particular conversations on your mind with that? Anything he, any interesting questions he raised or anything? Well, you know, 
he's just kind of getting like found. I think he's had a, a lot of in, um, interest in things like um, what does post capitalism look like, right? And um, he was recently a little um, like had like <laughs> um, why aren't why aren't the people who can recognize all the corruption and all the cap like that capitalism is bad? Why aren't they doing more? Right? Um, right. No, these are questions, especially question. if you're organizing that you've asked many times. <laughs> You know, um, and I think a lot, you know, repeatedly, I kind of keep coming back to is not who cares, but want, just just keep working with other leftists. Like you sp try to spend a lot of time expending a lot of energy trying to determine how are we going to recruit people? You're probably never going to recruit that many. And then you're just distracting your efforts from actually, I don't know, organizing a food drive. You know, or a coat drive or a phone zap for fucking, you know, like, right? Yeah. You just do it. That's what I was going to say is I think one of the benefits of one of these these videos y'all are doing is that people get intimidated. A lot of people do. They recognize it's money that like, that's always my thing. I always knew I hated fucking money. I just didn't exactly know why and all the intricacies. And I mean, I still don't know a lot, but people, they get, they hear people speaking about theory and it can be overwhelming and intimidating. And they, and they just, they, they just don't want to ask. They don't want to, you know, they don't want someone to yell at them because they have people sometimes on. I remember that one socialist that ripped me a new one for instead of explaining, she just called me stupid or something. So we don't need that. And people are pretty patient on the left. I think they have who I've come across with have been patient with me, but that's not going to be a hundred percent of the time. It's, Probably not 60% of the time because people are at different levels in their learning. So, <coughs> someone can click on this video and oh my gosh, this guy's asking what I wanted to ask, right? Right. And I'll say, you know, and, and then especially they get encouraged to have the discussions. Sorry. Like, we, no, no, no. Uh, thank you. Um, like, thank you. Um, like, maybe more so on um, just on, whoops more so just online um but there's like this sort of inclination especially with newer leftists they don't want to be seen as not knowing what the fuck they're talking about and i think most people who embrace leftism tend to be pretty intelligent people like like there's a base level of intellect there that not always okay but um some of these concepts can be pretty complex and um so I think there's a lot of posturing and there's a lot of people who act in like they know more than they do. And what comes with that is a lot of like defensiveness. Like, whoa, whoa, don't you disagree with me? Like people get really like, I generally see that as someone who really probably doesn't have a, a very strong grasp on the theory and the history if they're getting really, really upset when they're challenged. And, and I think doing this with Foff, he's, we're telling people, hey, it's okay to just be like, because it is okay to just be like, I don't know that much. I've read this, I've read this, and I've read this. And that's it. That's what I know. And um, because nobody ever comes or ever becomes fully formed as a leftist. And you have to start somewhere. And if you're not honest about what you know and what you don't know, you're, how, like, you're not setting yourself up to learn. <laughs> Instead, you're just trying to defend whatever bullshit take you had in the moment. And, you know, and so, and the best way to grow as a leftist is to be real honest with yourself and with others about what you know and what you don't know. Nobody owns this information and none of us created it. It's just, when have we had, I will say, a lot of us have had the privilege 
of being able to study a lot of this shit. Most people ain't coming up on all these kind of books. You only see a fraction of my bookshelf. I have a lot of fucking books and I've read most of them. And most people just, that's one of the things that's, that's my white privilege. That's a definite manifestation of my white privilege right there. That I've been able to come up on a collection like that and, and be able to have the time to study it. So right. no one should feel bad for not having knowledge. And, and sorry, I keep rambling and I know you want to get in, Kate. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that, uh, that's something I wanted to say about like a lot of like uh, education programs is like a lot of people when they try to design them are like, well, what are the questions I expect somebody is going to have getting started? And it's like, don't, don't do that. You're wasting your time. Because, like, everybody is coming from, like, a very different perspective and might be coming in for different reasons. You're not going to be able to cover everything, uh, like, in, like, one reading in one specific order or anything like that. Like, th like don't bother. Like, you know, answer questions as they come up. But the most important thing, number one, as an educator, um, is, like, if somebody asks a question and you don't know the answer, the greatest answer they give is, I don't know, let's find out. Right. Like, and like do the investigation and like work on like finding out what the answer is. Like social investigation and like, you know, building knowledge collectively is just like so much better and more impactful than just like, you know, well, I read six six of these books have have you read them uh, you know it, it's it's not as helpful to just like quote at people as it is to like you know try and generate knowledge um on terms that like you create right uh, mm -hmm. it's just yeah uh, and those, there's those always, were like my two cents on all of it if you're and there's always someone that if you're gonna act like you know some shit on some shit that can spot that you don't know what the fuck you're talking about because they actually do know some shit on that shit, you know, and they're just and looking at you like going, up. dude, shut up. Right. Oh my Those God, how cringe. Those people always be clowned on and like cyber bullied uh, and not taken seriously. <laughs> Price, what that video, oh no, you didn't share it. I'm sorry. Um, Black Flag shared it. It was Cyprus, call it? No, not Cyprus, that's here. Shoot. It was university, I cannot remember. Anyway, it was a discussion on, I can't remember the exact title. I think it was culture. I'm trying to find Anyway. It. They dropped a couple links in our work group this morning. There was a um, there was a panel, and they were having it, and it's awesome. I mean, it's almost three hours long, but I would tell everyone to watch it. Is it Cyprus University? I swear it was Cyprus, but Let's maybe see. it's just that troll. <laughs> I, I got her name stuck in my head. Um, was it the White Trash 400-Year Untold History of Class in America? That was one of the links that I Black Flag trash. dropped. No. Nancy Eisenberg? It was, it was yesterday they shared it. Oh, okay. I'm not going to go back that far. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll find it eventually and they share it in there. But the, the panel was there and um, there were professors from different areas. Um, and the one professor, she, I don't remember her exact credentials, but she was a feminist. And there was a black male professor and she kept chiming in and relating um, um, basically women's oppression to like fucking everything, like everything. And then the white woman and the black woman. And I understood the point she was making, but she got called out twice at the end. Um by two of her peers and that should happen is it, it shouldn't be all nice from nice. emory university it shan 
Pardon? Emory University. Emory. So at least it started with an E-M. Yeah, right? so the video is called Whiteness. The meaning of a racial... Why? It's called Whiteness. The meaning of a racial, social, and legal construct. It's yeah. on the YouTube channel, it, it, Emory University. Awesome. It's awesome. I really, I, I would rewatch it because I know... Thank you, I Black Flag, for so dropping that in the Slack. <laughs> ...conversations. But yeah, so she got called out and she kept, she would interject more. It wasn't like the question was to her or she took the question where the rest of the panel would take a question and then that was it, right? And she would just keep interjecting this, you know, that the 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 white culture is just as bad for the white female. <coughs> And, and it just really diluted other issues that were being brought up. And so she got called out at the end. But the one professor, I could see his foot going when she was talking. <laughs> one, he was just like rocking back. And I could tell he just wanted to, to go on and rip her. Well, and and it's because, look, it, it gets to, you know, what Martin Luther King said, and I will not even come close to getting it right, but he ca talked about how he came to free the white oppressor as well but he didn't come out and, and and say that that means that they're just as oppressed as us because they're adversely affected by their gross behaviors of course it, it's look man I, I would venture to say that none of the fucking toxic scumbag terrorists of the clan or and all these people and neo-nazi boneheads and shit i don't think these people live pleasurable existences i think they're fucking miserable yeah. Okay, but what they're not is lynched or violently and brutally oppressed by the fucking most powerful mechanisms on the planet and, and, and never have been or never will be. It's not to say that white women aren't abused and that was the point she was trying to make and, and they are a product of the white male patriarchy that that's what it was. It was why so many white women voted for Trump when they're oppressed by the same white male patriarchy. So that was the correlation. And the, but the, the thing is, is she kept bringing that like that was the issue for different scenarios and situations of. It's like you know, a one white it, imperial sort of the equivalent patriarchy. of a one issue voter or a single issue voter kind of. Kind of. Yeah. And it was like, our, I think she's a historian. So it was just like, why? <laughs> You're not like female studies and all females aren't white. Like, that's what I was thinking. You know, why do you keep saying this shit? <laughs> right. Anyway, so. Like, a, like somebody really corny, like constantly bringing up that like, you know, misogyny doesn't, it is like not ideal for men either. Though, like, I'll tell you who it's a lot worse for. Right. <laughs> right? Absolutely. Uh, like, yeah, that, that's a type of argument that, like, you know, if you bring it up once, I'll be like, yeah, that's true. But if you, like, bring it up twice, I'm like, shut up. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, <clears throat> Is this really like the the crux? Is this the important rhetorical point? We have to just be like, we have to hashtag not all men uh, misogyny. Right? Like, is that the only? Thing? Well, and it and it, it's um, akin to class reductionism, right? It's sort of maybe it's gender reductionism. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but um, but it's reducing everything to one issue essentially right when it's broad and it's diverse and we can we can very clearly point to one of the worst mechanisms of oppression on the planet but we can't write off everybody's individual dispositions as being reflective of what that state does right that that actually um resigns us to being just reactions to the state and that's all we are you know we're all directly affected by that state and to varying degrees. But there's other components of our lives that comprise who we are, all of us as individuals, right? And it's, it's like 
getting stuck on one hot take and just, you know, beating it into the ground, you know? <laughs> Nothing yeah, when in they, life is they, that when they cut were and dry. Describing the complexity of, you know, this uh, what the heck is the name of it again? The social construct. Sorry. Whiteness. <laughs> the whiteness, yeah. The 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 different tiers, right? No, I mean white women do it because even though they'll get beat or raped or whatever by the same white male, that white male will also protect them and give them status, right? It's like she made a good analogy at one point about how um slaves would go in and the slave master would go in and have sex with his property, you know, and then the female slave owner would come out and beat the slave all over again because she had sex with, because she doesn't control her body. She's owned. So it was like, yeah, she yeah. can't. She can't go beat it, her husband. Standing up for the woman, <laughs> it's the hierarchy. She she has status and privilege. Ah, uh, grossness. Gross. Really gross. So what I'm saying is, stop being white. Like, just stop it. Okay. <laughs> Actually, there is no such thing as white. I celebrate my Scottish heritage, even though I'm also Mexican. Um, but I go to Robert Burns dinners and I got kilts and I'm, I have a genuine love and appreciation for my Scottish heritage. I don't know what white means though. I don't know what that is still. I think that just means, um, I want to be a bigot and, and, um, hate things I'm afraid of and don't understand. I think that's what that yeah, my, is. My grandpa celebrated Highland games and wore a kilt and did all that marched and that kind of stuff. But. And I'll tell you what, no Black Lives Matter activist has ever given me shit for celebrating my Scottish heritage. Ever. But then my grandma equal celebrated her native heritage. I mean, not like my grandpa did at all, because she was extremely modest, but celebrated. I'll tell you what, my Scottish heritage is not better than your heritage. It's not. It's not better. It's just, it's just what my family was. Just what? And it's no, it's no better than my Mexican heritage, and my Mexican heritage is no better than it. They're both awesome. <coughs> I, I'm, there's deep things in my past, like my ancestors. Had, dude, we haven't had documented verifiable facts, and so many Latinx people say this. But listen, the story in my family has always been that the way... Um, my family came to the States was my great, great grandfather and his brothers, actually his brothers owned a brothel in Mexico. And apparently they provided women to Pancho Villa and his soldiers and rode with him. So my family's story is that once Pancho Villa started forcing women, like children and stuff, they turned state's evidence and came to the United States with political asylum. Um, now, that could all be absolute nonsense. Um, but what I do know is that I found out much later that there were two brothers that owned a brothel that rode with Pancho Villa and brought their, basically their harem with them. I've seen now, that doesn't mean that Someone in my family didn't catch wind of that and heard about that and tried to act like that was our story, right? But like, I'd like to think it's true, not because they were brothel owners, because that's fucking gross, um, but that they were involved in a revolution <laughs> and that when children were employed, they bailed on it. Mixed bag, mixed bag, fam, right? My grandma told me, well, my dad first, but um, about when she was real little, 
they lived, she was born in Deming, New Mexico, which is real close to the border. But back then, I, I don't think it was like border, border, you know, there were no walls. Um, and she can remember being real little and her mom saying, you stay in the house and do not come out. And she would go out. What did, what did they call the resistance? The, the individual band, band, like bandits. Uh, Banditos? Did they call them banditos? I don't. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, with the war, it was the t end of the war. They were on their. They were the fighters. They were on their horses, and they would come there. And my grandma would give them food and water, and they would give her gold or not gold pieces. They would give her money, coins. Oh, my, I know what you're talking about. The word is on the tip of my tongue too. It's not banditos. But damn it fuck is their name and it's not cowboys which is i can't no, pronounce no, no, no. it uh, but it's like that it's it's um fuck anyway <laughs> so yeah my great grandma gave the horses water and fed the fighters it was because she had to she was afraid that's why but she did it <laughs> i don't know in her i mean that's my indigenous side maybe in her heart she was like fuck these fucking people <laughs> But in the Mexico. end, it's just, this is inconsequential ultimately to who we are as individuals today, right? It, it contributes to who we are and we should acknowledge it, right? Like, but I, I feel like I'm the only one of me. I'm not my grand, great grandpa. I'm not my great grandchildren. <laughs> should there be any, <laughs> I hope. Uh, but so yeah, I just don't get this. Well, I get it. I understand where it comes from. I wonder. I mean, is is race truly an invention of capitalism? I don't know that there was a lot of um, talk of race prior to the solidification of capitalism. I mean, there was xenophobia, right? There's always it's been xenophobia. It's definitely it's a product of people against each other. It's I a mean, product. I'm sorry. It's a product of colonialism. And it started with Bacon's Rebellion and other uprisings. But I always, you know, I've begun to think of uh, that, like, Lenin had it backwards, that, like, capitalism is actually an extension of imperialism and not the other way around that uh, colonialism was just a stage in that development <clears throat> that's just my take i don't know if i understand it <laughs> um but that's where racism comes from that's where whiteness comes from is the bacon's rebellion and it was, you know, invented whole cloth. Like, did people say, I <clears throat> they didn't say white people before that, right? That wasn't a thing people right. said, was it? You know? And wouldn't that xenophobic <clears throat> been like, uh, it would have been based on cultural differences. They're from this other area and they do things differently there and we're afraid of yeah, that. But not, oh, look at the like, color of your skin, I hate you. Until 1967... Was it 1967? It's when it changed. There were only certain parts of Europe that could come here. And then they started opening it up to other... And I learned this from that doc, but I knew about it. Then they opened it up to different parts of Europe. But when they came, they were oppressed. The Italians, right? So it was like... You know, a trickling in of the, but it's always been, there's always been the others, the others, the white and the others. Right. The, but different people have come into the white. Yeah. And the like, reason for that is just because, sorry, Drew, were you just saying something? No, I'll mute. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, like the big reason behind that is because. Just fundamentally, like what whiteness, is, uh, how it's defined, and how it was systematized, right? 
Uh, and that whiteness has always been based on, like, purity, right? A, a very, like, Protestant notion of, like, purity being, like, you, you are either all white or you are other. Uh, you know, Barack Obama has, like, a white mom, but he's not white, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so, like, on some level, I think the... You know, while I, like, you know, identify, like, white, I'm certainly not, like, proud of being white, Jesus. Uh, you know, it, like, there's a lot of historic and cultural uh, factors that, like, uh, necessitate my recognition of myself as white. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but to speak about the Italian Irish, you know, uh, because, like, this definition is so constrictive and so based in, like, purity brought about from, like, Christian missionaries and colonialism, like, white people are would eventually, like, go away if you weren't going to, like, eventually bring in Italians and Irish people and the Jews, et cetera. Um, and you'll find a lot in uh, when like white supremacists start to like build up power, the definition kind of like starts to move in reverse. You know, the Jews mm-hmm. become not white, then like are Italians white, are are Irish people white? Um, it's it's always about like you know, uh, you and know, it's select- usually about class, really. Yeah. That group already that had immigrated prior that was other eventually moved up in class and then it, you know, and it keeps going and going. So, and then other, others get absorbed into the white group. Are the reptilian shapeshifters that live in the center of the moon, are they white? (laughs) I don't know. I'm sure of it. I don't know. Q hasn't posted about them in a long time, so I don't know what to think at this point. Yeah. Well, see, the one thing I was going to, the distinction I was going to make, and I'm not sure that that is true with Asians, but there is an other group that is never going to be white, and that's Africans. They'll never be white. But indigenous will eventually when the blood quantum goes away they're white like i have to say i'm white right it's ridiculous i'm going to venture to say that the reptilian shapeshifters that live in the center of the moon are white there there what now q or tin foil hats that's right what people are all reptilian shapeshifters that's probably true too so that would make me part reptilian. Yeah. I'm kind of down with that because I would I would love to see the center of the moon. I'm expecting her to wake up and run in here and go, oh, I was dragging in my past life. <laughs> She's still zone. And they're interdimensional shape-shifting re- re- reptilians too. You know what I mean? Like, I'm down to get some interdimension on. Right? Warp factor 10 and see what happens. Right? I'd probably get, I'd oh, yeah. vomit. I'd get motion sickness. <laughs> you get warp, like, af- past warp six, you're just like, yo, <laughs> this interdimension shit's a little tough on my belly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Important issues, fam. Well, you know, the original, like, man in black theory well they were supposed to live in the center of the earth right have you heard about this i did not that know was that. apparently apparently that was all like anti uh asian a whole conspiracy theory like men in black were originally supposed to be asians most likely chinese i can't remember if this is yeah it's probably cold war sure yeah Interesting. It's a little fun fact there. 
I like Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> Which um, is disgusting on its face, this notion that, oh, Asians, yeah, they're actually, it's a way to dehumanize people, clearly, right? The, to say, and it doesn't, it wouldn't surprise me that it would be part of the, um, um, it's not yellow fear, what did they call it? Um, yellow peril. Yeah part of all that propaganda right that would probably be one of the deepest levels they're literally not human and not even from the planet be terrified gross i stumbled across a random post on some ufo site had nothing to do with the the page it was commented on it was this long screed about how all Asians can read minds. And uh, oh God. I know it's like, it's, it's disgusting, but almost comically so. <laughs> Trotsky was also well known, uh, anti Asian racist. Uh, he, he like wrote, I think it was an unpublished biography of Stalin. Uh, in which he said that, like, you know, Stalin's uh, Asiatic upbringing uh, brought out his uh, inner brutality as a, a dictator. But like, just wow, super like transparently racist. Awful. And do you think uh, he believed that? I mean, if he believed it, that's gross, and he's a racist. And if he didn't believe that and said it, then he was okay with employing racism to make a point. Either way, like... Right. It's kind of my same criticism with, say, uh, Marx's uh, on the Jewish question, uh, in that, like, you know, while Marx might not have explicitly been an anti-Semite, he was certainly willing to, like, utilize anti-Semitic, like, tropes and like stereotypes to like make his own particular point right uh uh though i would say trotsky's was a lot worse because oh, it was just like active character defamation yeah and then that's like, overt right yeah, it's not it, problematic it's, right. it's not just problematic and wrong it's like per purposeful you know and right. and callous and even and malicious right yeah. Yeah. I guess I'm just going to have to fucking turn in my Trotskyist card. <laughs> you know, um, I, 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 in all honesty, I've just not never read Trotsky. I just, it hasn't, like, I'm sure at some point I, I want, I'm going to want to because I just want to have the context of what he wrote. Right. But like, right. I've never felt any need or desire to be informed by Trotsky's philosophy at all. Like, and I read Lenin yeah. and Mao. I'm an anarchist that has no problem reading fucking red literature and theory at all. And I enjoy a lot of it and feel enriched by a lot of it. But I just haven't... I would probably, honestly, read Stalin before I'll get around to Trotsky. Isn't Trotsky who had the affair with Frida? Right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she eventually... like dumped him and became a Stalinist, which is incredibly funny. Uh, but <laughs> uh, in terms of, like, reading Stalin, uh, I actually, like, highly recommend it. Uh, but, like, particularly his work, uh, Dialectical and Historical Materialism, like, it's just, like, really, like, straightforward and not too, like, complicated read, and it's just, like, okay, some people don't know what this is, and I'm just going to, like, formulate a list of, like, here are the features of dialectics, here's materialism, here's how they merge. Uh, it's it's really good. Uh, great teaching tool as well. Um, though, I, I will say you'll probably have uh, less enjoyment reading, uh, uh, I think it was called On Anarchism. He, he doesn't not big on anarchism, as you could imagine. <laughs> well, see, and uh, actually, 
I probably would enjoy reading that because um, I'm not intimidated by critiques of anarchism at all. In fact, I let me hear them. As long as you're actually right. critiquing anarchism and not throwing out straw man bullshit. And then if that's what he's doing in that work, I would be like, this is a straw man. This is bullshit. And here's why. Right. So in a right. lot of ways, my ongoing mission of wanting to um, combat sectarianism like, I think that's one of the best ways to do it. Is let's look at what the early Marxist Leninists said about anarchism. Let's listen to what Bakunin actually said about Marx. Let's read what Marx said in response and let's find the faults and find where they're right. I think uh, uh, early on, a lot of the divisions that, that have that grew out of between anarchists and communists were because people picked sides in some of these debates when maybe the people having them saw themselves still on the, as on the same team. You know, maybe, maybe those divisions weren't as entrenched as we may think now, you know, 125. They had critiques of each other, you know, but like, shouldn't we be doing that today? Shouldn't we be critiquing each other's theory? And like, if you're getting shitty about it, then fuck you, be comradely. But like, we have to. We have to critique each other, or otherwise we're not going to grow. But definitely. And, and like, even just like looking into the history of like, say, someone like Mao Zedong shows that, like, you know, the distance between the beliefs of, say, like, anarchists, especially Maoists, uh, is like not a massive gulf, right? There really isn't. Uh, I mean, I would argue that Mao. Um, arrived at things that some early anarchists espoused and were criticized by Marxists for. Um, yeah. Mao was an anarchist yeah. uh, before he like um, um, founded, like helped found the Communist Party of China. Like he he was an anarchist for years. And it was um, <laughs> not Bookchin, but who was it that he was the anarchist? The, uh, well-known anarchist that he was reading and god damn it wasn't it Kropotkin or Godwin no um maybe yeah Kropotkin he definitely knew of Kropotkin um and I can't think of who I'm thinking of damn it but but he was definitely uh, openly like uh, in, informed by this one specific anarchist whose name I'm is slipping my mind right now um I don't know, man. It's just yeah. like, what are we going to do, <laughs> anarchists, if I'm we're going to, if we really want to end capitalism, how are we going to get there? And we're going to have to have some type of organizational principle. And I do believe that the earliest anarchists knew this. That kind of knew this and had no problem with it. Emma Goldman, who wrote one of the most well-known scathing criticisms of the Bolsheviks, was totally supportive of them in the beginning. And the vast majority of her criticism of it Basically, her thesis of it was whether she was right or not is here's where you departed from socialism. Here's where you didn't stay true to what you said you were going to do. Here's where you left your own theory. Now, whether she's right or not, I didn't hear a whole lot about, hey, man, is, um, a vanguard is wrong and evil. And um, she was all for it. Bakunin had the International Brotherhood. It was actually a secret vanguard, fam. It's Bakunin. I, I like, and you know, one of the major things that, um, that the major, one of the major things that was at the core of what happened in the um, disagreements between Bakunin and Ma Marx during the first international was Bakunin and the alienistas were arguing that Marx was wrong to suggest we should use parliamentary processes as praxis towards the revolution. Okay. Marx wasn't saying, and, and then actually, and, and um, the, the alienistas and the people, the Bakunin anarchists essentially were saying there should be no participation whatsoever in any type of bourgeois parliamentary processes. Marx argued um, that it can be useful, like an inside out kind of thing which I don't think was, but followers of Bakunin then labeled that 
as authoritarian. And I don't see that as being an authoritarian assertion by Marx at all. I think the anarchists were wrong in that assessment. But I think Leninists and Maoists arrived at that and said, no, you, you can't win by voting. You can't vote away capitalism, right? You can't elect away capitalism. So they ultimately came to, they ultimately did arrive at what the Bakuninists were asserting. And, mm -hmm. and that, I'm, I'm open to hearing your criticism of that, but um, they were asserting early on that, oh, well, actually what I would say was, that's where I see the genesis of the do-nothing anarchist comes from, which I don't think is a fair assessment of the position of the anarchists at the time, because they weren't saying, don't do anything. They were just saying, we think that if you, get involved in these parliamentary processes, you'll end up getting lost in that process and lose sight of the revolution. And I, from my understanding, I think Lenin and Mao arrived at that same position, but I'm open to hearing how wrong I may be. <laughs> um, I'll say in terms of Mao, like you're essentially right, but like uh, China didn't really have like any kind of like democratic representative system. Oh, right. Uh, like in the 1930s. So like there wasn't really like any way for him to participate. In it wasn't way. even an option, uh, right? <laughs> right. Right. Uh, and uh, the Bolsheviks in 1905 uh, through kind of alternated depending on like particular conditions and how engaged people were with bourgeois politics as to whether or not they like run people in Duma or not. Um which the Duma wasn't established until 1905 in the February, February, yeah, February Revolution, uh, in which the Tsar Nicholas basically had to cave and set up some like bullshit, like anything, like parliamentary process. Um, so, I, I would say like, kind of, uh, they came to the conclusion that like participation in bourgeois politics wasn't useful, but like uh, I, I would say that Lenin wasn't like strictly for or against. Well, like, and in the international... Tool, use a tool when it works, right? Use sure. a hammer when you see a nail. Uh, not everything's a nail. And, uh, and the, um, the, in, the international ultimately adopted a, a compromise that they wouldn't come out and outright ban participation they saw room, and I still think there's some truth to that, where it can be useful on some level. I think we have to be very, very careful how much emphasis we put on, because I think there's truth to that. Like, you, if you're going to go be a senator, like, there's so much you're going to have to do that's going to be a total distraction from any type of anti-capitalist stuff. You have to be really, really strong in your convictions, I think, to really endure that. But, and correct me on this, Correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, Kate, but my understanding is one of the major distinctions between the Mensheviks and the Bolsheviks was sort of this right here, right? That like, and that even Trotsky, my understanding is advocated early on sort of, let's elect socialists and revolutionaries, right? And that was a big part of what the Mensheviks organizing principle was and Bolsheviks were more opposed to that. Is there truth to that? Am I remembering this correctly? Um, there is to that um the mensheviks very much like uh saw it as like a road in and of itself that could like bring about uh socialism whereas like the bolsheviks were like no we have to like combine like above ground legal obvious work that like we mobilize people around combined with like clandestine illegal shit um uh, that, you know, organizing strikes and labor unions and uh, things of that nature, um, which is why Bolsheviks were called majority. What Bolshevik mean? Minority, and and, right, right. Or minority. Yeah. Uh, uh, so pretty much Bakunin yeah. was a Bolshevik, is what I'm saying. <laughs> no, he wasn't. <laughs> Well, I was going to say, and uh, maybe Aaron can 
correct me if I'm wrong, but on the other side of your point, didn't the isn't it true that the anarcho syndicalists ultimately developed a more nuanced view of that under the rubric of uh, say you know diversity of tactics right. and that every every inch gained is an inch needed to be it through reform or or not I mean isn't that correct? No, uh, well, yeah, I mean, clearly, because that's a, a, a term that's deeply and closely associated with anarchism, right? Diversity of tactics, right? Like, you learn that one the first day you become an anarchist, I think. Um, and I don't see, um, like, la in later years, I don't see Malatesta deep-throated um, um, advocating against any form of parliamentary process. His vote what for pamphlet gives you a lot of reasons for why it could turn, you know, backfire on you and could ultimately hinder you in the long run. But he wasn't out like calling people counter revolutionaries for trying it. Right. Um, so I think there's truth to that. And I embrace that. Like here, look, I, I'm not out here thinking that AOC and the squad is, I don't waste any time thinking that they're going to get anything done for me, but there's a chance they might. <laughs> so I'm not trying to get in their way. You know, I'm not trying to call them sellouts or counter-revolutionaries until I see evidence of them being like literally counter-revolutionary like Nancy Pelosi or Biden, right? Like, but it won't surprise me if that comes up either. And if they start doing this deep-throated shit, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But... If they're going to fight, like, I don't think we should be as anarchists or socialists or communists out here putting all our efforts into trying to get Medicare for all. I don't, but I'm not going to try and stop them from trying, <laughs> you know, like, but I would probably caution against one of my comrades. Look, look, to answer your question on this, um, we totally got behind um, Comrade Carrico's run for Senate. And I and I still feel like we were right to do so. He was running a propaganda campaign. There you go. And I and I don't think Carrico would have got if they had won, would have got lost in it and sold out the revolution. I think that they genuinely would have used it as a platform to sell anti capitalism and to push anti capitalism. So I think there's potential for it being useful. I'm not gonna go find out myself though. I don't, I'm not planning on running for any office anytime soon. God, what a nightmare that would be. Yeah. I, I will say that, like, um, you know, running for office in the United States is, like, a very different beast from, like, running for office in, say, uh, the Russian Empire circa 1910, right? Where? Um because, like, uh, that was a parliamentary system, whereas, like, this is, like, bicameral legislature um, in which like, there's no thing as, like, coalition, right? So, fundamentally, like, you have to, like, support somebody that's in a party that's fundamentally compromised um, and won't hold them to any sort of principle, right? Um, and won't be... And even if, like, say somebody from CP USA, ESL, or MCPOC, who, who knows, like, uh, were elected into a place in American Parliament, like, the Democrats aren't uniting with them. <laughs> like, that, you just, I, I, I don't really see much of a route uh, in America, like, pursuing. Absolutely. And, and, and for people who may not be as aware of parliamentary structures, now not all parliaments are structured this way, but if you get a majority of your party elected to parliament, they get to put up the prime minister by default. Yeah, they control so, the government. So it is, right? you can't, there is a fair argument to be made that if you can get enough anti-capitalist revolutionaries in parliament, you could literally conceivably take over the government. Um, or at least I think there's a better argument to be made there than definitely here. I think you're totally dead on in, in like, just, I, I don't ever see the squad growing to any numbers that's gonna, like, they're never gonna take over the majority in Congress. 
the squad. It's just, and if no. they did, we're talking 15 years after the planet melted and we're all dead. Right. Yeah, the squad also, uh, like, has also done some stuff that's put me very off uh, recently. Like, saw some pictures of AOC meeting with, like, far right speakers. Well, uh, like people that tried to back up the Wong Guaido coup. Um, I hadn't heard shoot. that. That's a serious fucking problem, comrade. She's meeting yeah. with fucking backers of Guaido. I mean, like, yeah. if she's meeting with them and then making a public statement about how disgusting they are, then okay. Did I? Did she make that statement? <laughs> uh, she had to be like kind of pressured or put uh, a polish ice back into her. Uh, website or demands. Uh, it was quietly removed uh, a couple of months ago. Somebody like on her Twitter noticed, it, like called her out on it. Like she, did, like her team or whatever, quick like added it back on the website. What was it? You kind of cut out a little bit. What was it that they retracted? Explain that again, uh, if you could. Ice. Oh, what? I'm sorry. <laughs> Abolish. Ice. Oh, she's backtracking on abolish ice. She did like quietly for a moment until somebody saw that that wasn't on her website anymore and like called her out on it. Um, so personally, I don't see myself like holding out any amount of for that these like like the squad really going to like deliver. Or even like meaningfully push on any of like their campaign shit. Um, and we don't live in the Bronx. Like the vast yeah. majority of what she can actually accomplish isn't going to affect us. She's not. Uh, uh, Bobby O talks about this a lot that he's continuously baffled that people outside of his district care about her so much. <laughs> he's like, I have my opinions because I live in her district. She's my rep. So he has. He has He's in the game, as it were, right? Like, and she does not have, you know, it's funny. The Turks constantly talk about, like, look at everything that she's been able to accomplish. I'm like, what? A fucking Twitter following? I haven't seen one law passed that you can, that has made any of our lives better. She hasn't achieved any of that stuff. And why should we think she can? She's one person amid 10 people in a squad. Like, and what, because people are fucking saying M Medicare for all and Green New Deal on Twitter more? Who cares? Like, that doesn't right. affect real-time change. And, I, and it's weird to me that people see that as some type of real-time change. Yeah, if anything, I, I see it much more cynically, and I see it very much as a facet of counterinsurgency rather than as, like you know, a growth in the socialist movement because it's really just like uh, a movement toward like bringing more people into like voting for... Uh, it's sheepdogging to the DNC, man. Yeah. It's DSA. Like, it's, it's, hey, don't worry. AOC will handle it. Go on home. She's right. got it from here. Well, fuck that, man. <laughs> I was going to add that the difference is is that and i don't know if she was a democratic socialist she was she was dsa yeah she was that. dsa so she's not a proper leftist so if a proper leftist went in there they know it's a game they know the only way they can get any legislation passed is if they bend over and take it up the ass from the corporations that's it period into story that's how it works now that's how it's always worked but not necessarily corporation but if a proper leftist went in there they know that they know they're not going to be able to get anything done but maybe they can awaken people but then again you know it's awaken them to what for more people to, a, a, a false hope that, for medicare for all you know, a false Pardon? hope for a Green New Deal. We're not going to get a fucking Green New Deal, man. It's not. No, but that's my point is someone coming from a democratic socialist, a progressive, a liberal stance 
once they get there, they find out they can't actually make change. They're hopeful. They're on a high. They just won. They just gathered all these people to campaign for them. And then they get there and they realize how shit where it really works and how bad it is. And then you can't fucking do anything about it. And so they're going to give is my point. We're a proper leftist. They already know this. And that's not what they're going there to do. They're going there to disrupt. Right. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like the only principled way to be like elected to the House of Representatives would be go in there, make a bunch of noise, and basically like do a Fiona Apple at the Grammy every day. Being, this is bullshit. Like, <laughs> like turn off C-SPAN, nothing you can do that thing. Don't, don't believe shit that comes by any of these fuckers. Uh, that dude is a liar that just spoke before me and they're disgusting and they're paid by this person, this person, and this person. Okay, and now the next person that's going to talk, they're scum because they're going to do this, this, and this is what they're doing. Don't believe them. It's bullshit. Nancy Pelosi ain't ever going to get you this Green New Deal. She's a fucking liar. Here's where her money comes from. That's what, uh, if you're going to get anything done there, that's the only thing you can do. Yeah, maybe and like, get the filibuster ended because you'll never shut up. <laughs> <laughs> and like the Marxist in, I think it was Oregon, Marx motherfuckers at the end of his speech. Right? Right. Just like, power to the people. Marx. It. <laughs> it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a higher platform, right? I don't know. That's the only thing I could, I could see doing because I no one from the far left is gonna go there thinking anything's gonna happen other than them getting pushed out and not reelected. <laughs> but they can, you know, make a disturbance while they're there. And the squad has, sort of gives the illusion of making a disturbance. A lot of right wingers are really freaked out. Um, and aren't they all women? Or there's one? No, they got Bo- Jamal Bowman now. I think that okay. they kind of see Jamal Bowman as squad. Maybe I don't know. I don't. So I'm I not even paying that's attention. That's a lot of why the right wingers hate them too. Like I wasn't even not- paying that oh, close God. attention to the Trump administration either, man. Like why the first very beginning i was paying close attention because it was like holy shit these guys are hardcore racist wow okay and they're facilitating these street violence and shit so i cared but like (coughs) kind of more concerned with what you guys think and are doing than any of those people like it has more relevance and i think to my well directly clearly has more relevance to my life but like whatever small seemingly inconsequential work that we may be doing, uh, I think it's far more important than anything that AOC may or may not accomplish. Even if you want to give her all the benefit of the doubt in the world. I still don't think that she's going to get any of this. I'll be massively surprised if I ever see universal health care come out of Congress. Pre-fucking revolution. Like, I think that the... um. It's going to get more dystopian, man. This fucking climate change shit is going to get gnarly worse. And the more it goes on, it's not just, it's not on a steady pattern. It gets exponentially more fucking terrible every goddamn day. And we're doing nothing. And I don't care that some fucking um, Democrat talked shit to an oil exec the other day and said, oh, please. Because they didn't end that fucking oil exec's power at all, at all. That was making the rounds the other day. Some liberal was fire as fuck and took down some oil exec. And I'm going, no, they didn't. They said some shit on TV and then that oil exec went back doing exactly what they've always done. We're still fracking in liberal California. So, So, I mean... Earthquake, I, the final collapse of of this country. I drew drew. I think hinted at this earlier, but like this is all gonna fucking collapse, and I think that's incumbent on us to have some sort of mechanisms in place to do something about that when it does. To have some foundation in place so that we can be in solidarity and and come together as a community, right? To survive it. 
And it's like uh, a whole new definition to uh, uh, revolution pending survival. Where? Revolution for survival, whichever. But... <laughs> But yeah. we're trapped under patriarchal daddy, right? We, not we. I'm not. I'm saying the globe of human beings. They want daddy to fix it, and so daddy's not fixing it. Yeah. If anybody's watching but this and I you made it two and a half hours into this, I would suggest yes, I would that um, if you haven't already, start looking into joining some type of anti-capitalist group, party, or collective or effort. Um, I don't see any other thing that's going to make any difference in this stuff or make any change other than people who are focused on anti-capitalist efforts. Right? Not everyone has access to that in their communities. Maybe you're, that means you're the one to start it. But you have access to the internet to educate and learn and, you know, have people to lean on. That kind of stuff. Yes. That's important. Because it gets... It gets hard, you know, dealing with and or not knowing and, yeah, knowing actually what's going on. Any the other? People, I, sorry, I, I just really think that people, I don't understand is what I'm going to say, why people aren't paying attention. They know the climate's changing. They understand it. They believe in science. But it's like, it's not going to affect me, I guess. But it is going to affect your kid or grandkid or great-grandkid and all the species on the planet. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a kind of like they're not paying attention or don't want to do anything. But rather that most people are just like in a position where like they functionally like can't do anything or feel like legitimately that they can do, right? But if you're stuck in like dead end, forty hour a week job, and or like two, then and you're barely making ends, and like your like daily needs are barely being filled, um, you know, it's going to be pretty difficult for you know even if I can explain. Uh, all of the facets of climate change and they agree that like okay that's bad but if I don't make it till next Tuesday then me knowing this isn't like, that helps gonna make yeah, and if you're working two full time jobs and, and uh, you know you're exhausted you know like I ain't gonna shame someone who doesn't get involved and because I don't know what, what I do I is try to honor those who do that's what I try I'm to do. I'm talking more you know? about people who actually could free up some time, you know, to do something other than vote and buy into that system. That was that I just wanted to make that distinction because I was that person <laughs> working three jobs and getting recyclables out of trash cans to try and have enough food on the table because we had to have somewhere to live and that's all I could afford. So, yeah, I hundred percent get that because that's why i wasn't paying attention you know it can be a privilege to pay attention no doubt correct but i have to admit i just got to the point where i can't keep fooling myself that i can't get involved some way because i would cry myself to sleep other night Fantasizing about robbing a bank or an armored car isn't like realistic, <laughs> right? But that's what I would do instead of if I just took that little bit of time to do something or do something better, like educating myself. So that's the way I like to look at it with people because it is overwhelming. You come home and you just want to turn on the TV and tune the fuck out of everything, right? <clears throat> don't want to pay attention to anything. 
Well, that's why, like, look, one of the things I appreciate so much about this little fam we have here at P4P is, look, we're, we've done some organizing as a group, not much. Most of us have done organizing as individuals in other ways, right? Like in other things and it worked and we come here together. But first and foremost, I think what we are is a support network for each other. We're a place where, hey, hey fam, fuck it just, I couldn't take it anymore today. Well, you can come to us and, and, and we'll hear you out and, and relate to your issues, you know? And that is so crucial, especially to have other people in your life that understand capitalism's role, not just people who love you and care about you, because there's plenty of people that may love you and care about you, but don't get it. They don't understand the role capitalism is playing. And so you can't conceivably actually tell them what you're enduring. You know, um, like for, uh, Pico the Bear talks about, he has a, um, he, his therapist is a Marxist. Like how fucking lucky is that? To find a, a therapist that can act, because listen, man, most people, if they don't understand capitalism, they're not going to understand why we give a shit so much about this stuff. To them, it's like, why are you obsessed with all this history and theory and shit? I don't get it. Like, it's so much more than that. It literally is directly affecting my life every day. And to be able to have you, fam, to come with that stuff and say, fuck, this is just, Shan, when, you know, to be able to hear... I can't stop what? crying over this fucking gnarly shit they're doing. That I think that's why we're here for each other, right? Oh yeah, I mean, you said early on um, about having a support network in your community, what, however that consists. But you have to have a support network, and not just you know, um, and I don't mean just food or you know like mutual aid type but mental health and no i'm not a therapist but I've been in therapy a lot <laughs> you know but right now i don't have a therapist i have an old therapist that i she's my only therapist i can call her when i need to but that's that's about all i have first of all you need money um but yeah, it's it's critical because you're going to get alienated from people. And in, and I, what I want people to know, and this will make me cry, is it's not you. You're not choosing to be alienated. You're choosing to be true to you and who you are and your core beliefs that you've always had as a little kid, but you just didn't understand all this shit, right? And so I truly believe that's what draws us together is those core beliefs. And then eventually we realize that we need changes within ourselves and to educate ourselves in different areas. And then once we get through that kind of stuff, we can take on stuff like theory and, you know, choose what is the best for us and like me I just say I'm a nonconformist I don't know I don't know how to pick an organization because I don't believe everything from every specific theorist and you know what I'm saying it's like I I like this and I like that I, I like to I'm like the Dorothy Parker I just wasn't a famous writer that was at the Spanish Revolution you know <laughs> but she she never called herself anything but a writer I don't even call myself that. Y'all do. But, um, yeah. I just, I showed up because I couldn't fucking take it anymore. And I knew I had to do something. And in my family, there is organizing background with my mom. She was a community organizer. And then my dad is union. And I've always been in a union when I can be. Um, so I did have that, you know, my dad went on strike a few times. So there was <clears throat> that exposure. So I knew I had somewhere to turn. Like I would go, I take Nick when they were little and go to the March in Santa Ana. And I can remember this one woman going, why are you here? Because it was for immigrants rights. And I just started crying. And I'm like, great, I got fucking white lady tears going on, right? But I just, I, I didn't answer her. And then she patted me on the shoulder and I, she said, I just wanted to thank you. But it may have been a translation thing, but it was like, why is this white girl here? 
Like I grew up in Santa Ana. What are you talking about? But no, I'm here. I'm here for you, not me. You know, <coughs> that's why I'm here. But ultimately, I'm here for all of us workers. Right. But yeah, Nick liked that. That was Nick's first exposure to activism was a May Day march in downtown Santa Ana. That's a great first experience, May Day. Fuck yeah. Raising a right, Chan. Trying. I don't even get me wrong. I there is no perfect parent. We all know. Is Aaron gonna get his vaccine on May first? She just asked if you're gonna get your vaccine on May first. Oh, I don't know if I'll have access to it. If I if I'm eligible, yes. That's good because they're the. No, we're recording, we sweetie. Vaccinated on on that very day that we're all fucking free. We're all free. It's gonna be a while. I know it's gonna be a while, but fucking sit, fucking finally, you know. You know what I mean? I know it's getting tiring for us. Well, Anyways, what, listen, fam, we are at two hours and forty-five minutes into this hour-long conversation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> It's like, but we haven't done this in a couple weeks and the last two weeks we haven't really pulled off a meeting. So I, I've loved this. I much enjoyed this. I'm glad we covered a lot of ground. Um, there hasn't been anything up on P4P really relevant to any type of thoughts or analysis of the Biden administration. So I'm glad that we had an opportunity to do at least a little bit of that. Um, yeah, this was awesome. Is there, um, Unless anybody else Price has act- any closing thoughts or. Uh, you're going to hate me, but has anybody been following the Chauvin trial? Oh, that's right. We were going to talk about Chauvin. Um, I watched a little bit of jury selection. Um, so no, I haven't been watching it that closely. Um, I play, Unicorn, for people who don't know, Unicorn Riot is live streaming from inside the courtroom every day. For like seven hours, but it's been all jury selection, right? Um, I plan on watching yeah. a lot more closer when the actual trial hits. I have been hearing disturbing things coming. Um, I've seen some disturbing things on Twitter about the jury selection, people that are actually watching it every day. Um, anyway, that's about what I know, Price. <laughs> um, yeah. I suppose it's uh, way too early to really weigh in on it. But is it true they, uh, I don't know, blocked off the courthouse with barbed wire? Or oh, yeah. Shit like that? Yeah, that's been up for weeks in prep. Like layers yeah. of like fence with razor wire and then another fucking, <laughs> you know, not just one fence with razor wire. Then there's another one and another one. It's like... Locked down hard, man. When yeah, what they when they effect. sent three that cops to the that. Capitol on January sixth. I think it was three, maybe four that were there. State Capitol Police, you know. Yeah, and that's you know, you know yeah. fuck them like for that, man. Know. That that says two <laughs> things. That's it says one of two things. It says one, we're gonna acquit this motherfucker for murder. And we expect you people to freak out over it, which they would be every human being that would freak out over it would be totally justified for it. Or it's it's a way to um, demonize people that have been affected by the murder of George Floyd. Like we're irrational and we're going to do violence and riot to the state. There's no reason to believe that we're going to do that. Like this preemptive preparation for... Mostly, I mean, and it's that maybe, you know what, I should, I should retract that a little bit. It's not us. It's not we. It's black people. It's a massive insult to black people. I it's think. definitely a statement. Yeah. You going to say something, Kate? Uh, I was, but uh, don't worry about it. Oh, good. 
But yeah, I definitely plan on watching um, once that trial kicks off. And, you know, I... I don't know if they're gonna that bring in that third um, murder charge against him, which was what was it specifically? That was serious. Um, it was. That's what delayed the jury selection. Um, I can't remember. I mean, when when um, when they definitely want to get some type of convictions, they stack charges on you. I mean, so. It's only three charges. You know, you hear a lot of people, they'll get one charge or something and then they get picked up and sent to county and then two days later they get ad booked with like 15 more charges that the court is most likely going to drop almost every one of them. But it raises your bail up and fucking... Um, but it also means that they're ultimately going to get you on something. Now... It's only three charges against this murdering fucking piece of shit pig. But that's a little more than what we've seen in the past, right? So I don't know. So it's um, the third, third degree murder charge. There it is. On top of a homicide and manslaughter. I mean, what... what? <clears throat> I don't know. We'll see. (laughs) I picked an article that doesn't list the other charges for whatever. Oh, fuck Derek Chauvin. How's that? That's my final thoughts. Fuck that murdering pig piece of shit. However, if they let him just go, they acquit him. You think last summer was bad? And, and yeah, I mean, people want to be safe because of COVID-19, but it's going to change if that happens. What happened after those pigs with Rodney King? I don't, we might, I, I stand that by it, that we might still work. see, I, we might not be as asleep as we think. I know I, I could I'm I could be proven wrong, but I think once we get over the major hurdle of COVID, we might start seeing some more mass mobilizations. We might. I hope I'm right. <laughs> um, I hope you're right. I know that I like. There has been actions that I said, "Nope, I'm just not going." I'm just not. Um, and the, the few times I have been out in the last year, it was kind of like one of them was a bunch of fucking anti-masker Q people that organized in downtown Reno. And there's just no way I wasn't going to go and talk shit. There's just no way. I'm not going to allow that to just stand in my town. No fucking way. And I knew nobody else in Reno would go confront him. So I went and did it. But like, and there was, um, in the first week of the BLM uprisings, and not the BLM, in the George Floyd uprisings, I went to a BLM action in downtown Reno. But like, I have purposefully not gone to stuff because I'm deeply conflicted on it. On, I'm not judging people who go out and march during COVID at all, okay? Because the vast majority of the people on the left are incredibly careful and they're making, they're taking a lot of precautions. I just, I know I'm anxious to get out. <laughs> I haven't been out since a few months before COVID for any kind of an event or action. So anyway, any other closing thoughts, fam? I'm good. Okay. Price is good. I'm good. Well, I appreciate y'all. I had a good chat. I enjoyed this. Uh, I I did too. You had a last thing, did you say, Kate? Yeah, I do. Uh, Which is actually related to the Biden administration as well, uh, which is that George Floyd bill uh, that went through uh, that uh, increased 
uh, federal funding for one, uh, but two uh, was a meaningless uh, ban on the colds that wouldn't have done anything in terms of like George Floyd, right? Because uh, one, it assumes police would follow the law, which you know, just, they don't do that. But two, and more more importantly, like George Floyd wasn't killed by a chokehold. Somebody like right. like kneeled on. Died. But wasn't uh, um, wasn't it already uh, considered illegal in the uh, by the police force? Wasn't it outlawed by the police force that used it on Eric Garner? Yeah, it was already. It was already officially like, on yeah, police record that it was outlawed. Right? Outlawed. Didn't stop. Him. They didn't care that that's not allowed. Like right. they'll get away with it anyway. Right. Uh, and they just a, a couple months ago, and it could have been four weeks ago. I'm not sure. They did the same thing in San Diego. So, there you go. And it, that is so deeply, deeply disgusting and offensive to invoke his name, to raise more funds for the gang, the racist gang that murdered him. That's so typically America, man. That's so typically America. That is and historic. That is what America is. Is we murder a man and then name a law where we get more funding to do it to other people after the person we murdered. That's America. Brady Bill. On uh, that note. <laughs> no, I just had a brain fade again. Damn it. I forgot what the hell you were talking about. Oh, I just was, isn't it, the Israelis train police force in certain tactics, and I, I believe that that is one of them, the knee on the neck. I yes. believe that we reported I, that at the time, yeah. that, that yes, that there is actual hands-on, one-on-one training with um, IDF forces, training, uh, doing seminars and stuff with law, enforce, law enforcement in America. I believe uh, yeah, I believe it was a private security firm that has a revolving door with the IDF to be uh, okay. technical. That but one yeah, degree of, the, of separation, well right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's why the pictures from Palestine look so much the same as the pictures from here. It's all Western imperialist right. capitalism, fam. It's all fascism. It's all the same machine. We think that they try to tell us that there's borders. They don't. They don't adhere to those borders. They expect us to. They try to keep us confined in it while they move freely about, spreading their fucking oppression. Their murder. It's fucking so gross. Anyway, I love you, fam. Love you too. Um. Love you too. Let's do this again next week. And so I should probably say, since people watch this, um, dude, you got all the way through this? Big ups. Much love, thanks, and appreciation to you for watching these three hours. Uh, and what I always say, much love, thanks, and appreciation to anybody, everybody, who does what they can, when they can, to get up and out in an effort to make life better for other people. Because it makes a difference and it does matter. And... Much love, thanks, and appreciation to all of y'all here in P for P too. Yeah, Bye, much fam. Love. Uh, much love. All power to the people. All power and to the people. Words of my favorite SM ASMR. Death to America. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, how about on three? Death to America. One, two, three. Death, Death to, to America. America. <laughs> that was not good. We. Totally fucking flailed that horribly. That was the worst in unison death to America. Ever. I could have made my voice way deeper and I didn't. Yeah. We're going to work on that over the next week. <laughs> and we'll see you on Fam Chat next week, fam. Later. All right. Talk to you soon.